Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today for NCSSM's COVID-19 Symposium. I'm so excited about this event and the amazing scientists and leaders we have with us who will share their insights and work related to helping battle the terrible COVID-19 pandemic that has so impacted everyone across the world for the past year. I want to first begin by thanking our guest speakers for joining us this morning. Dr. Collins, Dr. Corbett, Dr. Fisher, Dr. Gay, Dr. Olick, Dr. Tropsha, Dr. Thorpe, and Secretary Sanders. I'm sure that many of you in the audience probably recognize this, but I, I want to make sure to point it out that these scientists that you're going to hear from today are truly the all-star team of scientists in our country and in the world. And we're extremely fortunate to have this opportunity today and truly honored at NCSSM to be hosting this event and to have all of our guests with us. Thank you all so much for your time this morning. I also want to recognize Dr. Amy Sheck and Mr. Bob Gottwalls for their leadership and work in uh, conceiving and planning this symposium. Before we started, uh, several of our guests were talking about, well, how, wow, how did you put, on, put together this lineup? Uh, and it was Amy and Bob. So thank you both for, for making today possible. Today's event is such a timely and amazing opportunity for our school community and the broader community to be engaged in learning more about the battle with COVID-19. Uh, so Bob and Amy, again, thank you for making this possible. And I also wanna thank Lee Welper and Donald McIntyre for planning and the technical work behind today's webinar. And also to thank our faculty who'll be leading some fascinating workshops this afternoon. For many of us here at NCSSM, particularly all the members of the class of 2021, you might recognize that it was exactly one year, to get, year ago today, March 13th, when we had to close campus and send all of you home and switch to virtual learning for the rest of the academic year. At that point, we were just beginning to understand in a very personal way the impact the pandemic would have on all of us uh, and the world. I know, to that, I know at that point, I certainly did not fully comprehend the magnitude of the impact the pandemic would have on our community and every single person in our country and across the globe. At this point, the impact is certainly much clearer for all of us. And as devastating as it has been, it could have been so much worse if not for the work of the truly amazing scientists we have with us here today and many other scientists in our country and around the world. From scientists and healthcare professionals at the NIH, the CDC, those at universities like UNC Chapel Hill and Duke, and at organizations like RTI, and in our state and local health departments, we have received guidance on how we could keep ourselves safe and those around us, and how we could safely operate our school with students on campus this academic year. We've maintained less than a 0.2% positivity rate in our testing on campus so far this year because we've received great guidance, and everyone in our school community has done a fantastic job of making the sacrifices necessary to follow it. And now we can begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel with the rollout of multiple vaccines. It is absolutely amazing that scientists, some of those with us today, have been able to develop, run trials, and deploy multiple vaccines in less than 12 months. Unheard of, and again, absolutely amazing, and something for which we can all be truly thankful. In this year of so many challenges, many of which have been significantly exacerbated by those that have refused to listen to and follow the science and the guidance of scientists, what I think we can and should all recognize is that it has, it has been the unwavering commitment of scientists to solve this most challenging of problems and the willingness for so many like those in our school community, in spite of all the noise and misinformation that has abounded this year, to do the right thing and follow the science. That's what has us looking forward to the next 12 months being much brighter than the past 12. I again want to thank our very distinguished guest speakers. Dr. Sheck and Mr. Gottwalls and our faculty for making today's symposium possible and for everyone joining us for today's event. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Holden Thorpe. Dr. Thorpe is the editor-in-chief of the Science Family of Publications, a position he began in 2019. Prior to his current role, he served as the provost at Washington University from 2013 to 2019, and where he is the Rita Levy Montalucini Distinguished University Professor and holds appointments in both chemistry and medicine. Dr. Thorpe joined Washington University after spending three decades at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he served as the 10th chancellor and from, 20, from 28 to 2008 to 2013. He's a North Carolina native and he started at UNC as an undergraduate student and earned his bachelor in science degree in chemistry in 1986. 
He earned a doctorate in chemistry in 1989 at the, at the California Institute of Technology and completed postdoctoral work at Yale University. He's also an entrepreneur and an inventor with at least 18 patents. And he's a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and American Association of the Advancement of Science. I had the privilege of working with Holden when he was the chancellor at UNC and very much appreciated his leadership and the opportunity to learn from him. And Holden, it's great to see you, uh, even if it's virtually today. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Chancellor. And it's great to be with you all. Uh, congratulations to Amy and Bob for the extraordinary panel that they have pulled together here. I just get to be the MC. Uh, as Todd said, I have one of the greatest jobs in science, which is that I'm the editor in chief of the science family of journals. Um, and as Todd said, the people that are assembled here, uh, Dr. Corbett, Dr. Collins, Dr. Gay, all these folks, they're the ones who saved humanity. I'm just a guy who makes sure that the papers get reviewed, but it's an honor to do that. And um, I've gotten to see a lot of amazing science over the last year, that's for sure, and not just in this area. Uh, I think the fact that all these folks are here is a testament to the power of the state of North Carolina and how much people love it, but especially uh, the affection and admiration that everyone has for the North Carolina School of Science and Math. Uh, Todd does such a great job leading you all, and you're all very fortunate to be able to learn at such a special place from such special people. Um, I, <laughs> I was admitted to the first class uh, of at uh, Science and Math, and I made a dumb decision not to go, but it was the very first one. So the people who went in that first class were great pioneers and wow, everything that has happened since then is just extraordinary. So congratulations to Todd and all of you. Uh, <clears throat> my first task is to introduce Francis Collins, who is the director of the NIH. Uh, he was on MSNBC on his earlier Zoom call today. So you're getting uh, someone who was just uh, <clears throat> on another important interview. And if you've been watching the news lately, you've seen a lot of him on 60 Minutes and on Axios and uh, just about every uh, cable news channel uh, talking about the pandemic. But Dr. Collins has had an extraordinary scientific career doing many, many different important things. Um, and uh, I just want to put in a plug because uh, yesterday, we posted an editorial in Science Magazine uh, that he wrote for us that probably includes uh, some things that you're going to be hearing about in today's talk. Uh, Francis Collins uh, became the NIH director in 2009. He was the only uh, NIH director to serve two presidents when he stayed on uh, in the Trump administration and then just recently became the only NIH director to serve three presidents when Joe Biden made the very good decision that was a great comfort to us all uh, to keep Francis on at the NIH and he graciously agreed to continue to lead us. Uh, Dr. Collins was a leader of the Human Genome Project. Uh, he uh, got his uh, medical degree at the University of North Carolina. He is a grandparent of a North Carolina science and math uh, student. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences. He won the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the uh, Presidential Medal of Science. And he also won something I know he's very proud of, which is the Templeton Prize uh, in recognition of uh, his extraordinary ability to connect science and faith communities, something that is sorely needed in science communication uh, in today's world. So it is an absolute honor to introduce someone who is a mentor and leader and cheerleader for us all and an extraordinary scientist. Uh, please uh, give a warm North Carolina School of Science and Math welcome to uh, Dr. Francis Collins. 
Well, my goodness, Holton, that was incredibly gracious and wonderful to see you, albeit virtually. And let me add my voice of admiration uh, to Amy Sheck and Bob Gottwalls for having put together a truly amazing symposium for today. And I'm just honored to be part of it and to start us off by talking about some of the science of vaccines, which I think is going to be a main focus of what we're going to be discussing this morning. Uh, yes, I am the grandfather of Sellers Hill, who is the class of 20, uh, who is taking a gap year right now because of COVID-19, not being a terribly good plan for starting your college education, but will begin at Harvard in September. And uh, he certainly would speak about the wonderful gifts he was given as a student at NCSSM in terms of starting him on a path that is going to be really interesting uh, and uh, Sorry that he is not with us today because he's off in Hawaii building a garden for somebody. Go figure. So I'm going to share my screen uh, so I can actually show you some visuals as well as talk to you about this whole issue of vaccine development. And uh, hopefully uh, somebody will tell me that you can actually see this uh, in the title being How We Built a Better Vaccine, Curiosity, Persistence, and Partnerships. So I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of the NIH director, but you will hear from other folks who have been deeply engaged in this in the course of the morning. So hopefully you'll get a whole sense of just what an amazing team effort this has been to do something really unprecedented. It was early January uh, where in Science Magazine, yes, Holden, uh, we started to learn that there's something really serious going on scientifically in, in China, this uh, event in Wuhan. And then in January 9th, for the first time, uh, we learned that Chinese scientists were declaring that whatever this pathogen was, it seemed to be a coronavirus. And that, of course, caused a lot of ripples of concern since SARS and MERS had preceded this and are also coronaviruses. So where was I, the NIH director at this time? Well, I was right at the North Carolina School of Science and Math because uh, I visited you all uh, there on that Friday, January 10th, um, and had a wonderful time uh, visiting with some of the lab experiments that were going on with uh, some crickets <laughs> and also giving a talk and getting to know a lot of the students uh, again in being introduced to many of them by my grandson. And I came away with an incredible sense of, of what an amazing place this is and what talented, amazing visionary students occupy the place. But it was also kind of a moment because that very day, uh, the sequence of the um, particular virus that was causing this outbreak was posted on the internet by Eddie Holmes, who's an evolutionary virologist in Sydney, Australia. And so as I was meeting with your students, I was also getting information that caused me to want to stop and look closely to see what is this virus. And then we began down a pathway of what do we do about it? And as you will learn, especially later from Kismikia Corbett, who's a significant part of this whole effort, at the Vaccine Research Center at NIH on that day, January 10th, the design of the Moderna vaccine uh, that is now in many arms, including mine, got underway. There was no time to waste. NIH does have this remarkable opportunity, responsibility uh, to be the leading source of biomedical research support in the world, both doing fundamental basic science and applying that to extend healthy life and reduce illness and disability. So infectious diseases led by none other than Tony Fauci, the director of that institute, uh, is a big part of what we do. As the NIH director, I have 27 institutes and centers that report to me, all led by amazing scientists and all trying to do everything they can with taxpayers funding uh, to try to make discoveries that are going to extend life and, and uh, reduce illness. For COVID-19, uh, there were three areas that we knew immediately we would need to charge into, diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. For the diagnostic part, we set up a program called RADx, Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics, which if there was time, I could tell you about because there's some amazing technologies that we have been developed that are now leading to about 2 million tests a day, most of them point of care, which is really making a difference in our ability to figure out how to manage this. 
For vaccines and therapeutics, I had a personal hand in putting together a partnership called ACTIVE. You can see what that stands for, which now involves 20 pharmaceutical companies, multiple government agencies, including NIH, FDA, CDC, and brings everybody around the same table to design master protocols, to figure out the priorities, uh, and to be sure our clinical trial networks are set up in a fashion that they can quickly test both treatments and vaccines. We're gonna talk about vaccines today because I don't have that much time, but I could go on all morning if you gave me the chance. It has been an amazing ride and amazing people have come alongside and dropped everything as we all have been doing uh, for the last year to try to make these advances happen in record time because people are dying and we had to recognize that there was no time to waste. So let's talk about the vaccines. And of course, <sighs> We have to then talk about the virus, and we particularly have to talk about the spike protein that sits on the surface, because that's what your immune system reacts with uh, and, and recognizes if you happen to get infected with this terrible virus. So if you were gonna try to design a vaccine that would protect you against that, you would want to prime your immune system with the ability to raise antibodies against that spike protein. Without getting you actually infected, could you actually do that? Well, exactly. That's what all of the vaccines currently do, is to provide an opportunity for your immune system to see the spike protein, make antibodies against it, and be ready if the real virus comes along. That's how this works. And this is maybe a little overly simplified uh, cartoon for the uh, students at NCSSM who know a lot about immunology, but just for the heck of it. Just think of your body as basically uh, a biotechnology factory that is capable of responding to a whole lot of outside threats, uh, like those viruses that I have diagrammed in green, yellow, and purple. So if such a virus comes along, uh, your immune system, uh, that gadget that you see down there, uh, takes account of what's there and makes an antibody, that Y-shaped protein that's specific for that particular insult. And of course, once you have had those exposures, your immune system keeps a file cabinet that remembers what it has seen before, and then is ready, if called upon, to produce those antibodies very quickly. It doesn't have to go back to square one. It's got this information ready in its blueprint file to make those antibodies again. That's the idea of a vaccine, is that you basically prime the immune system by giving it a chance to make those antibodies that it can call upon if they're needed, if a virus comes along that you really need protection against. And to do so in a matter of hours or a few days, as opposed to maybe a week or more, which could be all the difference in terms of whether you're going to fight off that virus or it's going to get the upper hand. The vaccines that are currently being studied in great intensity and supported uh, with the Operation Warp Speed effort in the United States are six but they have three different so-called platforms. Uh, each platform has two different companies that are developing and testing those vaccines with help from the NIH and other organizations to do the trials. And you're gonna hear a lot about the trials uh, from Dr. Gay a little later this morning. Two of them are based upon mRNA. I'm gonna say a bit more about those in a minute. That's Moderna and the BioNTech-Pfizer uh, vaccines. Two of them are based on using an adenovirus vector, which is DNA, and that's AstraZeneca and Janssen. And two of them are actually purifying the spike protein and adding to it an adjuvant to rev up the immune response. And that's Novavax and Sanofi GSK. Um, of these that you see here, all five of them have now gone through phase three trials, and three of them have received FDA emergency use authorization, that being Moderna, Pfizer, and Janssen. AstraZeneca and Novavax are uh, already being tested in other countries as well, but are within the next month or two of having their phase three trial evaluated in the US. So watch for those. We could easily have five approved vaccines in the United States uh, by May 1st. Uh, we shall see how those go. But already now with the doses we have from Moderna, Pfizer and Janssen, we're in a circumstance for the president to be able to say, everybody who wants a vaccine should be able to get one uh, by June. Let me explain how the messenger RNA approach works. Uh, basically, the idea is, as you all know, a messenger RNA codes for protein. Instead of injecting the spike protein itself, which is what Novavax and Sanofi are doing, inject the messenger RNA that codes for that. 
into the muscle cells. And basically the cells go, oh, this is messenger RNA. I know what to do with that. It goes to the ribosome, uh, it makes spike protein, and that's what you wanted to do. Now notice there is no intact virus here. It's just the spike protein. There is no risk of this making you sick from the actual COVID-19 infection. It just makes the spike protein that your immune system can then respond to generating antibodies, and then you are protected. And this was the first time that a messenger RNA vaccine has been carried all the way through uh, to phase three trials and FDA approval, even though this has been around for a while as an idea. And it happened, and it happened with remarkable speed. Uh, here you see December 11th, December 19th, that would be 11 months after that sequence of the virus was put forward. And not only that we got a good result, we got a result which Tony Fauci and I had to agree was better than we almost dared to hope for. Uh, when Tony and I were looking at the way in which the trial was playing out, maybe in August or September, <clears throat> we would have conversations about, well, what do you hope is going to be the efficacy? Well, maybe 70%, maybe 75%. Nope, much better. 95%, 94% phenomenally effective and also totally safe in terms of the, the risks to people who were enrolled in these trials. And Dr. Gay will tell you more about that. That's 30,000 people for Moderna, 44,000 for Pfizer. This is a huge amount of data. So look at this, time to develop a vaccine for previous infectious diseases stretching out over years and years. And for COVID-19, 11 months. Uh, absolutely astounding record. Now, people will say, wait a minute, did you cut corners here? Should we trust this term? Sounded like maybe you're getting sloppy. No, everything about this was done in the most rigorous fashion. What we did, and Dr. Gay will tell you more about that as having been part of it, was to figure out how to get rid of the downtimes uh, in between phases one, two, and three and also how to make sure that we were planning for manufacturing of doses, even before if we knew if the vaccine was gonna work because you didn't wanna have a long gap there uh, once you had something that looked successful. And this had never been done in this fashion before. And again, huge credit to all those folks who rolled up their sleeves uh, to take part in this. So how did this messenger RNA approach end up working? And what were the tricks here? I want everybody listening to realize this was not a flash in the pan on January 10th of 2020, where somebody suddenly said, oh, well, you know, we've never tried mRNA. Let's try that. No, that's not how it works. Uh, the basic science that was necessary to be able to get this to work stretches back well, you could say it stretches back to the discovery of messenger RNA uh, in the 1950s and 60s, but it certainly stretches back 25 years to think you could use messenger RNA basically as a drug. How could you inject this into a cell and get it to be used for a productive purpose? Uh, that was not a trivial thing uh, to be able to do. And this uh, is written about uh, in, again, Science Magazine, a uh, hat tip there at the Holden, about how exactly we got to where we are. After all, in the 1990s, we were thinking about gene-based therapies. Messenger RNA as a possible vector didn't seem that promising. Low levels of proteins, degrades quickly, and most importantly, seemed to trigger an immune response that actually could be harmful because messenger RNA was seen injected into the body as something abnormal and foreign. Well, 2005, very important paper here, uh, from Kathleen Caraco and Drew Weissman and their colleagues. And certainly people are talking about, this might be a candidate someday for a Nobel Prize, even though at the time it hardly got noticed. And that was basically figuring out how you could modify messenger RNA to overcome these limitations by doing nucleoside modifications, basically changing the chemistry a bit. So you still coded for the same protein, but you didn't have the chemical uh, structures that cause the immune system through its toll-like receptors uh, to get upset about this. And that then opened the door to the possibility of using this as a source for vaccines. That was, of course, 15 years ago. On top of that, there had to be a really clear path forward to figure out how would you design uh, the precise sequence of that messenger RNA to make a protein that would be appropriate uh, for a vaccine. That's not trivial, a lot of structural biology necessary to make that happen. 
And again, here we are in 2020 for the spike protein of the virus that causes COVID-19 uh, being put forward in a fashion that taught Barney Graham and Jason McClellan and Kismikia Corbett, notice the co-author here, uh, how best to design that messenger RNA so that it's a little different than what the virus itself has as far as the precise sequence, but you fix it into the prefusion confirmation, which is more immunogenic. That was a big deal. That was a recognition that was adopted by all of the vaccine makers since then, without which we probably wouldn't be talking about 95% efficacy. So again, this has been a remarkable story and one should also think about this as not just COVID-19 specific, having succeeded with an mRNA vaccine for this agent, we are in a good position now going forward with other agents of pathogenic nature uh, to be able to do the same thing and to do the, the same thing as quickly as possible. Because all you need to make this particular vaccine or to get started is to know the sequence uh, of the genome of the pathogen. You don't have to have the virus in the lab, which is sometimes a long drawn out process. You just need to know the sequence. And that's pretty breathtaking. And what's been accomplished in those 11 months uh, to get to approval is absolutely beyond what I think most people would have thought possible. This is a story about scientific ingenuity and determination and motivation that's gonna to be told for many decades. So let's celebrate the vaccination. Uh, here in the middle, here's a photo of uh, the new president of the United States, uh, Joe Biden, in the laboratory at NIH, the Vaccine Research Center, being educated about how this all came to pass uh, by none other than Kazmikia Corbett, the doc who's going to talk to you shortly about her role in this. Uh, and over on the left there, you might see uh, Dr. Fauci, if you haven't seen enough of him already, because he's everywhere, including on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert last night. Tony is just this amazingly dedicated and articulate spokesperson, as, al as also being, of course, probably the best known infectious disease expert in the world. And it has been an absolute pleasure uh, to work with him on all of this. Lots of other pictures here of people getting vaccinated. In the upper right, you might see the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. She's at NIH. Uh, she's doing an elbow bump all right there with Dr. Barney Graham of the Vaccine Research Center, who working with Kazmikia, uh, I would say, are the main reasons how this messenger RNA approach ended up being successful. So that's kind of a nice uh, picture as well. And as of yesterday, uh, this is the data from eight o'clock last night, we hit a milestone. 101 million doses have now been administered, not just distributed, but administered, gone into arms. Uh, many of those first doses, uh, about 30 million people have gotten two doses. And interestingly, people over 65 at highest risk, 61% of Americans have received at least one dose. And I know this got off to a rocky start and there were lots of issues about distribution administration, but boy, we seem to be hitting our stride now uh, with two and sometimes more than two million doses a day and the way in which the manufacturing has geared up uh, so that there's going to be sufficient doses pretty much for everybody who wants one. Uh, we are on a very good path in, in the United States now to achieve this kind of immunization by this summer for people who are looking for that. And of course, we hope that will be everybody Meanwhile, worrying about the hesitancy that some people still feel about this, which is something we also have to address. So I've told you a bit about uh, things that relate uh, to coronavirus, particularly the vaccine efforts. A little plug here for my own director's blog, which I post every Tuesday and every Thursday, uh, stuff about what's going on at NIH. And for the last year, I would say 90% of it has been about COVID because that's what people want to hear. If you're not already getting that, or if you're not one of my Twitter followers at NIH Director, uh, please feel free to join up because I'm always trying to put information in front of everybody about what's new in the scientific investigation of this virus and what we can do about it. So that's a positive story, but before I finish, let's actually look at the state of the pandemic across the world and realize that Yes, uh, we still have a long way to go and we have a lot uh, to be grieving about in terms of what has happened over the last 14 months. This is the Johns Hopkins site, which I think many people look at regularly. I look at it every morning to see where we are. 
Over here on the left, global cases, 119 million. And for the United States, uh, 29 million. So we have about uh, 20% of the cases, even though we have only 5% of the population, that tells you we haven't handled this very well. And even more seriously, global deaths, 2.6 million people have lost their lives and more than half a million of those in the US also telling you that we haven't handled this in an optimal way when you consider uh, the frequency with which we have been hit hard by this. And we have a lot of work to do and it is truly tragic that over the course of these 14 months, there have been missed opportunities, uh, oftentimes because politics got mixed together with public health. And uh, that really is not the kind of thing that is going to serve us well going forward. We are now in a much better place with the vaccines getting put out there, with cases having come down, but they haven't come down that far. We're still 50 to 60,000 people a day getting diagnosed with COVID-19, over 1,000 deaths a day. And we worry about the variants uh, that are beginning to emerge in various places, including the US, that may be more contagious. So if there was ever a time to double down on those public health measures, of wearing the mask, six foot distances, don't congregate indoors, it is now. And it is really unfortunate that some political leaders don't seem to get it in that regard, that we really have to work together in order to get us through this and to have a reasonably good chance by the summer of being able to be in a better place. Uh, NIH has a website. If you want to know more about what we're doing, communities fighting COVID, uh, please uh, feel free to use that for all kinds of information about what we're doing with testing, with treatments, with our strategic response. But I want to finish just with this uh, slide about what hope is all about, because people want to have hope. We've all been through an incredibly difficult time. But hope is not a strategy all by itself. Hope in every sphere, as Peter Levi has written, is a privilege that attaches to action. Uh, no action, no hope. Uh, that button that I wear on my lapel uh, is a shape like a guitar pick for uh, reasons that might relate to the fact that I'm a guitar player. But it's supposed to remind everybody, and myself as well, that while we are the National Institutes of Health, we're also the National Institutes of Hope. And that ought to be the thing that we try to move forward by the actions uh, that we are taking. And for me, it has been an incredible privilege, albeit a totally exhausting one, to be able to serve as the NIH director in the course of the worst pandemic that the world has seen in 103 years. And I can now see a path forward that is gonna get us past this, but we're all gonna have to work together to make it so. For all of you students, if you needed evidence that science is the best solution we're gonna to have to an awful lot of challenges, whether it's climate change or whether it's COVID-19, here's your evidence. And so I'm really delighted that there are young, talented, visionary, creative folks that are gonna come and join us. And if you wanna think about a career in life science, let me tell you, it's gonna be in an amazing few decades here as we take everything that we're learning about how life works and how disease happens and take it to that next level. And you can be part of that team and we hope you will be. And with that, I will say thank you very much screen and see if there are some questions. I'm hoping there's somebody still there. <laughs> yeah, it's me. I, I missed my cue there. Um, I, uh, the, the questions are going to come from uh, the students and they're already prepared. Um, thanks, Francis, for an extraordinary talk uh, and um, all you have done to get us these vaccines with your colleagues. And uh, we're now going to uh, hand it over to Gracie for the first question. Good morning, Dr. Collins. I'm Gracie, and my question is, how did the NIH, along with leading scientists, coordinate a national effort to produce a vaccine in record time? Well, thanks, Gracie, for the question. I hinted a little bit about the partnerships that we developed, and one of them, this thing called ACTIVE, was a big part of putting together a master protocol for vaccines. And then we had to basically line up all the clinical trial networks that could actually enroll participants and you'll hear more about that from Dr. Gay. 
But maybe the most important thing I should say is we have to give thanks every day to the volunteers who agreed to sign up for these trials. And they didn't know whether the vaccine was going to work. They didn't even know if they were getting the vaccine or a placebo, uh, but they agreed to be part of this incredibly important journey in order to give the information that we all now benefit from in terms of finding out what works and, and what doesn't. So that was our most important partner, I guess. But it did take an, an enormous coming together around the same table, not worrying about who was going to get the credit uh, to bring the best science from every sector together and to do it at record speed. Uh, it was uh, one of those things that I think we have never quite tried to do at this scale or in this timetable. And it worked because of the dedication and the smarts of the people involved. Thank you. Fantastic. And now our next student question is from Morgan. Hi, Dr. Collins. My name is Morgan. My question is, as COVID-19 is affecting the entire world, how has international collaboration assisted in fighting the virus? Morgan, that's a great question. Uh, you saw that map of the world from the Johns Hopkins site. And while we focused uh, most of our efforts on the US uh, as a US uh, agent of research, we are deeply concerned about the entire rest of the world. Uh, as NIH director, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with the leaders of all of the other uh, countries that have major investments in medical research. Uh, we're having another meeting next week of that group uh, and that group represents about 95% uh, of the dollars that are spent uh, publicly on, on medical research. And we have tried in every way possible to coordinate, figure out who is running a clinical trial on which particular therapeutic, for instance. Uh, we particularly work closely with the United Kingdom in that regard. But with vaccines, obviously, we do want to be sure that successful vaccines are made accessible to everybody. And that is going to be critical for this pandemic to come to an end. It is both a, an altruistic motivation, but you could also say it's selfish. If this virus is still spreading around the world, we're not going to be able to say that the U.S. is out of the woods. So we have worked uh, and, and able to do so more easily now uh, with the COVAX effort, uh, which is the way in which vaccines are to be distributed, especially to low and middle income countries. I'm trying to make sure in every way that we've enhanced the manufacturing capacity. We are thrilled to see that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, is a single dose, which means it's going to be easier to distribute uh, in difficult circumstances. And it also doesn't require freezer capabilities beyond a simple refrigerator. That's going to be a big help uh, to the future. Likewise with the AstraZeneca, although we have less data about that so far in the US. So yeah, this, let's be clear, uh, global is not the opposite of domestic, and domestic is not the opposite of global. We are all intertwined as citizens of this planet. And if we forget that uh, when it comes to a medical question, uh, then we are not doing our job. So thank you for raising that, Morgan. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. And our next question is from... Uh, there we go, Nick. Dr. Collins, uh, thank you for your remarks. I would be curious to know what your view uh, were on what uh, the most important next steps for the scientific community would be in terms of um, enhancing and restoring trust in the work of scientists and other experts. Nick, thanks for the question. And it's really important uh, that we figure out how to do this. It is deeply troubling uh, when you look in the United States at attitudes towards accepting the vaccine that we still have, depending on which group you're talking about, anywhere from 20% to even 40 or 50% of people saying, I'm not sure I want this because I'm not sure I trust the science behind it. I think we have a history here that we have to acknowledge. For African-Americans, the history of Tuskegee uh, is still very much on the minds of people who know that that was a circumstance where medical researchers in an absolutely unethical way uh, took advantage uh, of individuals uh, to study a disease that was curable and didn't tell people that they could have been cured. Uh, and that lingers for a long time. So we have work to do uh, to try to explain ourselves and that this instance of COVID-19 and other things that we're doing now in science would definitely not go down that kind of unethical road. There would be no way in the current climate that we could allow somebody to do so. 
but that takes time. And I think one of the things we need to do, uh, Nick, is to have voices coming towards the skeptics that are actually people that resemble them in terms of life experiences, maybe even in terms of race and ethnicity. Because, you know, for me, this, you know, old white guy from the government to say, trust science, eh, maybe that doesn't necessarily cause those people who are skeptical to say, oh, yeah, I can I can believe it now because Colin said it. We need to have more of those uh, voices uh, that come from many different directions uh, that have credibility in their communities uh, to try to convey the facts. But I have to say, if I'm really troubled about the aspect of this uh, over the course of the last year, it does seem that we're in a crisis in our country in terms of people's ability to distinguish between things that are actually true, uh, objective facts uh, versus opinions that people may hold very strongly but turn out not to be true, or worse yet, conspiracy theories which social media has provided an amazing platform for distribution. So that would be a lesson I hope we can look at soberly in a case where, I'm sorry to say, I think the lack of adherence to objective truth has cost tens of thousands of lives. This is not just an uncomfortable situation. This is a dangerous situation. And how do we figure a way to come back as a nation to be a nation where truth is our standard, is our touchstone, it's how we make decisions. Scientists are in a position to be able to be the holders of those truths, although we all know that science also can be wrong and has to revise itself when new data comes along. So we all have a role and it's not just a few of us, it's all of us. So all of you students at NCSSM, whatever you end up doing, you're gonna find yourself in a position of needing to be a purveyor of facts, even when they're inconvenient. And I encourage you to do that uh, with all the energy and courage that you've got. Amen to that. We got two <laughs> questions left here. So next is Tyler. Uh, good morning, Dr. Collins. My name's Tyler, and I was wondering how we can execute a proper lockdown without causing loss of jobs, homelessness, and a tanking economy. And on a second note, if it's too late, just order another one after America's mostly opened up. Tyler, great question. These are all great questions. You know, I really uh, have not liked that lockdown term. It gets used a lot. It's sort of as if it's a, it's either all the way on or all the way off. <laughs> and lockdown means everybody goes in their house, closes the door, businesses are all totally closed. I think we have learned along the way that there's a more nuanced way to do this to prevent the terrible economic trauma that has happened in so many places uh, in our country and people are still suffering from. I think what we need to do is say, look at the data. Clearly, uh, putting a mask mandate in place makes total sense, but that doesn't mean you're locking down. That means you're basically trying to reduce or eliminate the spread of the virus from asymptomatic people, which is, this is the big deal about SARS-CoV-2 that, that's thrown us uh, into a much more difficult place. You have people walking around who have no symptoms who can be super spreaders, and that's why the masks are so critical. So yes, uh, let's not lock down, but let's be sure people are wearing the masks. And certainly let's pay attention to the other dangerous places where spread happens, which is often indoors uh, where there's not enough ventilation. And especially if people are tempted to get close together and take their masks off. Well, think bars for instance. So doing these things in a graded, thoughtful, science-based way where you can dial up or dial down the restrictions based on what's happening in the community makes a lot of sense. A absolute hard edge lockdown uh, uh, has not necessarily uh, made a lot of sense and has actually turned a lot of people off. Is it too late? You know, I hope we don't have to do this, but I do worry this B117 variant from the UK is now 30% of the isolates in the US. It is more contagious, like 50 to 70%. It might even be more serious and cause more serious illness. If we are in a circumstance where a fourth surge could still happen, we gotta watch closely. And that's why this would be the worst time to prematurely start opening things up. Uh, but we don't have to lock down to be smart. Let's try to find that balance. Great. So our last question from Sriya. Hi, Dr. Collins. My name is Sriya Mantana. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to kind of share your knowledge and enthusiasm with us. I was wondering, what is one thing about the current crisis that worries you the most? And what is one thing that gives you the most hope? What a great final question. Well, I just alluded to the thing that worries me the most. It's these variants, uh, the B1351 that uh, particularly has taken over South Africa, which is now in the US, uh, the B117 from the UK. And now we have our own homegrown variants in California and in New York uh, that are worrying us. This virus is able to follow an amazing path of evolutionary selective advantage as it travels through lots of people. The best way to stop those is to have fewer infections because the virus isn't going to evolve unless it has a person to evolve in. So that's what worries me. What gives me hope is looking at that trajectory of vaccinations over 100 million doses in arms as of today and seeing the path forward that that can get us to in this country and in the world to be able to say we have conquered this. I think we can do that. But as the president said in his speech on Thursday night, that's not just because public health people are doing, that's because all of us need to get engaged. That means wearing your mask. That means if you get offered a vaccine, take it. <laughs> Don't wait for the next one or wait for somebody else to try it out first. We can do this. And that gives me hope. And yes, hope is attached to action. We're all about action. And I know you are all too. With that, thank you all so much for the chance to speak to you as part of this remarkable symposium. And we've got lots of other great speakers uh, waiting uh, in the queue to tell you about their expertise, which is gonna be amazing. Many thanks. Thank, thank you, Francis. And one of the things that gives us hope is that uh, you're in the role that you're in doing all the things you are doing. And hey, thanks for all the shout outs to, to our journal. <laughs> we're, we're proud of all those papers and we really appreciate Dr. Corbett and Dr. Graham sending us the spike protein on February the 10th. Um, thank you, Francis. I know you probably got to go be on I some do. other major cable uh, ch channel in the next few minutes. So we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. The next uh, section is a tremendous panel uh, that will be introduced um, by our next uh, speaker. Uh, but before I introduce her, I just want to explain how this is going to work. We're going to use the Q&A function of, the, um, of Zoom. So you can submit your questions. Be sure that your name is on the questions so that Secretary Sanders, who will be moderating the panel, can uh, read out who you are. And if your question is selected, it'll be presented to the panel. So we'll be doing a, a Zoom panel with the Zoom Q&A. And uh, most of you have probably done that many times now in the last year. So I think that's probably self-explanatory. Um, now it's my uh, uh, honor to introduce the Secretary of Commerce of the state of North Carolina, Michelle Baker Sanders. Secretary Sanders got her BS in biochemistry at the first university where I had my first faculty job, North Carolina State. Um, she got her master's in health administration at Pfeiffer College. She has been an executive at many important biotech and pharmaceutical companies uh, in North Carolina, especially at Biogen, uh, where she had a very important role in the manufacturing facility there that employs so many scientists in the Research Triangle region. She has been an important advocate for equity and prosperity in the Cooper administration. She was the Secretary of Administration. And then she became the Secretary of Commerce on February 12th. So she's been the Secretary of Commerce for 31 days, but she still found time uh, to come do this for all of us. So Secretary Sanders, thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to you for the panel. Thank you, Holden, very much. I am so glad to be here today um, with this panel of experts that we have uh, coming before us and um, with the others on the program who are sharing so much of, of the intellect and insight uh, surrounding COVID-19 and the vaccinations and, and everything that impacts us and also everything that gives us hope. And I'm looking forward to hearing from the panel members on vaccine development and distribution, mask efficacy and other learnings from this past year of the pandemic. Um, I'm sure that you would set, share with me in saying that there's been so many emotions during this uh, difficult time for all of us, 
But I have to say, when I saw on television the truck leaving the Pfizer facility, which meant that there was product coming to market, I was so full of emotion. Um, I was full of hope. I had pride. And I was just so thankful because um, I was just pleased that the life science industry, uh, once again, and all the scientists and researchers had come through for society and for the world. And so that's just the way that it goes, I believe, in our sector of science. There's so much, um, so much that science offers to problem solving and to all of the tough problems that we are all faced with and will be faced with. Um, so I want to applaud all of you um, who have the interest and who are pursuing uh, the studies and really hope that you will continue to do so for, for sure the world needs you and needs uh, more people like you and the esteemed panel that we have today. I'm also very glad to recognize that we have fully vaccinated more than 1.1 million people in North Carolina. And in fact, the Kaiser Family Foundation ranked North Carolina as the first in the nation for vaccinating the largest share of its 65 and older population. And so that's uh, you know, no small job or task at hand. And so we're pleased to be here in this state as residents and, and be a part of that. And Bloomberg has recognized North Carolina as one of the best performing states in the country in distributing vaccines evenly among black and white residents. And that's due in part because we have excelled at collecting demographic data of those receiving vaccines. We have racial data for 99.6% of the people who have gotten a shot in our state. North Carolina is committed to a fast and equitable rollout and distribution of all available vaccines. And having good data on the race and ethnicity of those vaccinated in our state means that we can work to make sure that the population receiving vaccines mirrors the diverse population of our state. And so you can visit North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services website at yourspotyourshot.nc.gov to check on when you'll have a spot to get your shot. Um, and so it is a, a real pleasure and privilege to be a part of uh, state government and serving the state in this in this way. I'd like to call on each of our panelists now to briefly introduce themselves before we dive into today's questions. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Corbett. And Dr. Corbett, if you will just give us a, a brief introduction um, of, of yourself and, and share with uh, those joining us today. Dr. Corbett. Hi, everyone. I, um, I'm Kizmikia Corbett, and I am a bona fide Hillsboro, North Carolina native. Um, I graduated from Orange High School, and during that time, I actually worked at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill um, while I was in high school, and then also I went back to UNC for graduate school. So um, Carolina blue is the color of my blood, I like to say. Um, I now work at the National Institutes of Health um, in the NIAID at the Vaccine Research Center where I am a research fellow. So that is um, the part of your career where you're still figuring out your life. That's how I like to term it. But it's after you get your PhD and before you go on to do um, more independent research. And um, so I work under Dr. Barney Graham and I do coronavirus research and have done coronavirus research for the last six years there. And um, a lot of our research, as Dr. Collins explained, um, has really been proven to be very fruitful in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we've been fortunate enough to be able to deploy some of the science that we, we had figured out in the last six years towards vaccine development um, in a very rapid speed. Um, and yeah, it's nice. It's really nice to be here. I also almost went to North Carolina School of Science and Math when I was in high school. Um, but similar to Dr. Thorpe, I didn't understand what the the, the gravity of admission into the and into the school meant. And so, um, nevertheless, I'm still here today, and I'm a scientist, and I'm very happy to be with you all. 
Thank you, Dr. Corbett. And we are so proud of, of you and uh, really proud of those deep roots that you have here in North Carolina. Um, next, I'd ask Professor Fisher, please introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Michelle. I'm Martin Fisher. I'm an associate uh, research professor in the Department of Chemistry and Physics at Duke University. So a little darker shade of blue. Um, they also direct the uh, Advanced Light Imaging and Spectroscopy Facility. What I usually do in, during my day is develop methods that use ultra-short laser pulses to image the, the structure and chemical composition of very complex materials, such as skin or solar cell materials, or even, even historical paintings. I did a little bit something different during the lockdown. I was asked for help by a colleague, by a medical doctor from the Duke Clinic that who needed to help um, with testing some masks that he wanted to distribute to the community. So in response, we developed a, a very easy and low cost method to test the ability of masks to block droplets that are emitted during speaking. We demonstrated this technique and in, in a few household masks, very common masks, and we noticed a surprisingly large range in the performance of these, of these masks. So by doing these tests and developing this technique, we, we have, I think, helped um, improve the overall quality of masks. We have helped a large number of people and, and labs to set up their own rig to, to test these masks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would also like to welcome Dr. Tropsha. Dr. Tropsha, if you will introduce yourself to our members here. Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Alex Tropsha. I'm a native of St. Petersburg and Moscow in Russia. Um, I've been at UNC since 1989, uh, overlapping a good portion of my time with uh, Dr. Thorpe when he was at UNC. Uh, I'm a computational scientist. Uh, my interests have been in the area of computer-assisted drug discovery and uh, later in data science and application on uh, informatics in most general sense um, to make sense of biomedical data. Um, in the past year, I would say it's been two main areas and directions in our research. One is computer-assisted drug design um, against um, SARS-CoV-2. And second, uh, capturing and uh, making sense of an incredible amount of research that's been going on in different directions as it relates to coronavirus. Um, if you uh, mind PubMed, uh, as of today, there are more than 112,000 papers that's been published since uh, people learned about coronavirus. Uh, many impactful research papers have been published in, in, in science, thanks to Holden for uh, promoting this, this research. And so there's an enormous amount of information that relates to um, um, understanding the disease and um, disease progression and uh, the future of the disease and the future of uh, pandemic um, research and, and anti-pandemic research. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, interest in development, um, perhaps a little bit overshadowed by the success of vaccine into drug discovery, low molecular weight molecule drug discovery that still um, is uh, an incredibly important uh, area of research. Uh, patients, as you know, are managed um, if they happen to get sick uh, by traditional medication. So that area still um, needs to continue and uh, be supportive. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as you can see, indeed, we have an esteemed panel with us here today. Um, and I'm going to start and move right into the discussion. And um, I'm going to start with Dr. Corbett. Dr. Corbett, you're from a small North Carolina town, as, as I am too, um, and you've talked about how surreal it's been to be leading the cutting edge work of rapidly developing a COVID-19 vaccine. Can you talk to us about the equation of speed and safety in the vaccine development process? I'm sorry, you said the, the what of the speed and safety? Talk to us about the equation of speed and safety in the vaccine development process, how those two have been working hand to hand. Um, you know, sometimes I think that when we hear about the speed of forward right. in our 
sometimes people think, oh, is it really safe or is it not safe? Talk to us about right. that. Right. I, and, you know, I think um, Dr. Collins touched on this quite a bit. Um, but, you know, their vaccine development has been said um, via the media to take upwards of 10 years. And that actually is generally true. But there are uh, several factors that come into play in that, in that one of those large factors is the preclinical side of things. So that is before the vaccine actually gets into any one human ever. There is a large body of preclinical studies, um, most of the time in animals, to tell us whether or not the vaccine might be safe or elicit and elicit immune responses in people. And so that amount of data, that package of data that is necessary we had a full package of data around MERS and our uh, mRNA vaccine for MERS, which is another coronavirus that could have actually been submitted to an FDA for a phase one clinical trial even prior to this pandemic. And we were able to use a similar set of studies to move really quickly into a phase one clinical trial in the case of this current SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic. And as far as safety is concerned, aside from all of the preclinical testing that happened prior, there are checkpoints at each of the stages of clinical trial that tell experts, um, whether at the FDA and, and otherwise, whether or not a vaccine is safe. And as those checkpoints are made, made then you can go to your next phase of, of the clinical trial. So as Dr. Collins was saying, there, there was really this large effort to cut out the time wasted here, where we would wait and you would get full results from the clinical trial, you'd analyze them, and then you, the company decides whether they want to fund it and all these other things. There was resources poured into this, and there was really strategic thought around how can we cut out those times that are wasted so that we can move really quickly in, in the case of this being a very dire circumstance. But none of the steps were skipped. Um, actually. It's my understanding that actually some of the steps actually are compounded here and there's extra precautions taken given these circumstances. And, and so um, that's kind of how it worked out in it from a timing and safety perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Corbett. And I'm gonna go back a moment because I was uh, being too anxious and hasty and forgot one of our expert panelists to get an introduction for her, uh, Dr. Olick. I apologize to you for moving too quickly. And um, would you please uh, introduce yourself and then we'll go back to our discussion. Thank you, Secretary Sanders. I'm like you, I'm excited to hear from the scientists. Um, I'll say I am not a COVID uh, researcher. Um, I am a knowledge broker or a force multiplier. Uh, I am the vice president of university collaborations at RTI International. I support the research and implementation work uh, of colleagues and partners at RTI. Uh, and RTI, as many of you know, is a nonprofit mission-driven research institute located here in the Research Triangle Park area of North Carolina. And Dr. Corbett, I'm actually in Orange, joining you from Orange County, not that far from where, where you used to live. Um, and RTI is, uh, has been a leader in science and research for more than 60 years. And during the coronavirus pandemic, we have worked at local, state, national, and, and Morgan's question I think is important, global levels on a range of issues um, from predicting the scale of the pandemic to monitoring immunity and potential vaccine outcomes to helping teachers in the new environment to COVID-19 emergency preparedness messaging for people with disabilities and extreme low literacy, um, as well as slowing the spread of COVID-19 in the Philippines. So uh, the work of my, uh, my colleagues and the researchers at RTI informs policymakers, the medical, com medical community and practitioners. And notably, my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Doris Rouse is a member of the NIH group that Francis Collins uh, referenced uh, who work on uh, public-private partnering to address COVID-19 and future pandemics. So thank you. Thank you so much, and we're glad to have you here. 
um, um, back to our discussion. And you know, Dr. Corbett, thank you so much for really highlighting how speed and safety has worked together and can work together. Um, and the one thing that uh, we never compromise, right, is the safety part piece of it um, for the sake of anything, because that is so important and vitally important when it comes to a patient safety standpoint. So thank you very much for that. Now on to a second question. I'm gonna turn to Dr. Shropshire for this. And Dr. Shropshire, a recent article in the magazine Science discussed findings from viral epitope profiling of COVID-19 patients. Tell us about the implications of that research. Right, a great, a great, uh, really great and, and highly visible paper. It's been cited nearly 70 times and was only published in November. So that, that indicates the impact that it has. It really addresses a critical question that um, is not, or hasn't been, has been asked, but not necessarily answered. And that is, can we forecast the severity of the disease? We know the origin of the disease. We know the virus that causes the disease. But uh, it really touches on the issue of personalized um, medicine and personalized approach to figuring out which people are going to get infected, uh, how the history, the history of viral diseases uh, that they had, uh, demographic and other factors, uh, how those collectively determine uh, whether the person is going to uh, get the disease. And if so, uh, what the severity of the disease is going to be. And so it's really looking at an interesting way of um, making a test that could forecast uh, what's going to happen with, with individuals. Uh, it's the beginning, it's really multifactorial um, situation when uh, it's hard to make um, an assertive statement, but it's beginning to look into uh, methods and tests and protocols that can forecast the degree of the disease. And that really is critical in terms of selecting people who should be vaccinated more or less frequently, perhaps looking at the differences to vaccine reaction. So that's, that's overall uh, the impact of, um, of this type of research. Thank you very much, Dr. Shropshire. That was um, insightful and helpful to us to really understand those implications. Professor Fisher, um, your article in Science on measuring mask efficacy got a lot of attention from the media and general public. You have mentioned that in some cases, your data was misinterpreted. What do you want folks to take away from your research and what are your next steps in studying mask efficacy? Uh, thank you, awesome question. It was indeed a, an, an interesting story. So since this work was published in, in Science Advances actually, um, there were about 500 news reports related to this work. Um, most news reports got the gist of it, um, some really did not. I saw some headlines that read, um, certain face coverings increase a transition, a transmission of coronavirus worse than going maskless. That is not at all what this work was about. Um, this was really a developmental effort for, for a measurement technique to measure uh, mask efficacy, not, not with systematic mask test. So now, while, it was, while it's true that we measured one mask in particular that produced a lot of small little droplets, um, this was uh, so more droplets than the, than the control without the mask. It, we were very clear that this result is not generalizable to all masks. So in, to, in, in summary, basically, not all gators are bad. This is what this, the, the gator gate got started by, from this. So it depends so much on how you wear a mask and what material the mask is. If you do a single layer, a double layer, it's, it's really hard to generalize. <laughs> so the, the key message is that um, every mask is a little different. So be careful what you wear, use some common sense. So what's the other question was, what's next? So we are not um, the Duke face mask certification facility, right? We're not in the business of testing masks. What we do help people with is setting up their own rig to test these. We've, we've helped research labs, manufacturers, we've helped clinics, 
even a major airline, um, museums, all want to set up their own um, mass testing uh, rig. And this is going to be very important, not only for testing the mask, but also show that the mask actually does something. It's, it's easy to see the changes when you put on a mask versus when you don't put on a mask. OK, great. You know, um, Dr. Fisher, also, I guess, you know, one thing that I think Many of us, if not all, have noticed sometimes the masks that are worn, and I know you're not the certification body there, that are just right below the nose. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, give us your thoughts on that and, and your feedback on it. I think we all know, but it wouldn't hurt to hear that from an expert like you. Sure, it's, a, it's an awesome observation. And I've seen many mask wearers that have a mask dangling off the ear, right? A mask that you dangle off your ear is really not doing anything. So there's there's a that's a trade-off when you wear a mask, right? You you can do you can wear a mask that is really tight fitting, that's an N95, that is super tight, super good in performance. Um, that's one extreme. It doesn't have to be a perfect mask to help, right? You also need to be aware of that. You you need to wear the mask. Uh, you, you actually need to wear the mask. Right. So if you yeah. if you wore an N95 mask and you can only stand that for 10 minutes, then you take it off and put it aside. Then you run around without mask. That's not helping anyone. So you got to wear you got to wear something that you actually are willing to to stick with. If you go out and after five minutes, you toss it in the trash. That's not good. That, that's not a good mask. So yeah. it, the other question that I actually see in the in a, in a Q&A already is. Well, what about the people that that don't want to wear a mask and then they, they don't believe that that it's it's not valuable? Well, it's hard to believe to convince people that that have their mindset, but have an, have an open mind just because somebody else on Twitter says, oh yeah, masks are useless. Don't don't believe that. Do your own research. Look look at look at the facts. If there's there's lots of research out there that that shows masks, even if it's a even if it's a cotton mask that is not perfect, but that it maybe prevents ninety percent of emission, that really goes a long way. There's lots of demonstrations out there that shows that masks are efficient. That's why medical folks wear a mask. That they, they don't wear a mask just to look pretty, right? They, it actually helps. That's true, and thank you so much for that. Um, you know, Dr. Olick, one of the challenges with this firing um, is doing the needed social distancing that takes such a toll on us, you know, psychologically. And I would like to turn to you to ask, how can we use positive psychology to help us through this phase of, of containing the virus? What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Olick? Thank you, Secretary Sanders. Well, um, you know, according to UNC Chapel Hill uh, scientist, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, uh, what is needed now is not social distancing, but physical distancing and social solidarity. So the best is advice um, is to increase our positive heartfelt connections with others, especially people beyond our inner circles. And we know that connecting to community brings out the best in all of us. And over time, it makes us kinder, more humble, and brings us a greater sense of unity. So during these challenging times, it's more important than ever that people stay connected and help each other. I think really what we need are more innovation. We need more innovation around new approaches to socializing in, in safer ways. Um, ideally outdoors during the COVID pandemic. Yes, uh, I think that is uh, something we all can benefit from hearing and doing uh, during these difficult times and post pandemic as well, right? Um, just to be able to, to move safely and, and uh, engage ourselves and engage in a safe way. So thank you so much with that. Um, Dr. Shropshire, I'm gonna ask you a question um, and uh, around how we can better prepare, you think, for the next pandemic. And then I'm going to go to each of the panelists. And panelists, I'd ask you to just uh, 
maybe we have a speed round where you can give us a key takeaway for folks today. And so first, Dr. Shropshire, how can we better prepare for the next pandemic, which we hope will not <laughs> happen, but uh, we're going to be in that reality zone here because we know things do happen. So how can we better prepare? Let me share my screen, if I may. Can you see my screen? So um, this is, this is uh, um, a study that, that we have conducted sort of in this regard with a little bit of history and a little bit of projection. Um, the curve here shows research response to COVID-19 measured in the number of publications as of, as of about mid-2020. And the message in this paper is learning from history do not flatten the curve of antiviral research. And uh, what we have done here is to look at research response to pandemics historically um, that hit the world at different times um, in the last 20 years. And what we saw is this really, we talk a lot about a spike in different contexts. Uh, in all cases, it was a spike-like research to pandemics. The pandemics hit, people get interested, the pandemics goes down, so does the research interest in, um, in pandemic. And so uh, what we really advocated for, and I think that's my answer to this question, is uh, we, we, we should never stop um, antiviral research. Um, and just in contrast, this is what's been happening with HIV research. Since the beginning of the problem, it was a huge amount of attention given to developing medications and treatments uh, against HIV and it's been steady research interest funding and steady development of uh, medications against it. And so really what we need to do is to understand the sources of the pandemic, to understand um, um, similarity in, um, in uh, diseases caused by previous viruses and direct our efforts at understanding the general causes and, and sort of preparedness in terms of uh, uh, drug discovery, vaccine discovery research, but do this on a stable ongoing basis and, and uh, uh, really um, focus um, our effort on understanding how we can continue to develop rapidly broad spectrum antiviral drugs and broad, broad spectrum um, vaccines. So that would be my um, answer to this. Thank you, Dr. Schrotzer. Um, So panelists, as we uh, wrap up this portion of our panel and move into q and I'd like to ask each, each of you uh, a, a takeaway, a key takeaway for the folks here today. And uh, Dr. Corbett, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to get a little more specific on this question, if you don't mind. Um, you know, the field of science and STEM is in, I believe, desperate need of being more inclusive and diversifying uh, the talent and the pipeline that we have. Specifically with reference to COVID-19, we know that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted people of color um, with this virus. And so, you know, that's no surprise to me and, and hopefully is not a surprise to uh, many people. So I'd like to ask you, as an African-American and female in the space of science and research and, and, and the landscape there, uh, I'd like to ask you about what is your key takeaway for other young women and other people of color who would like to get into this space, but may have some hesitancy for whatever the reason. Um, I think what you have demonstrated and shown is what's possible for all people. And not only that, but you have also had to uh, overcome probably some, some challenges and barriers that are unique to you and who you are. And so I'd like to ask you, what is your key takeaway for uh, the students and others on the phone um, about what's possible, how to manage and navigate that, 
and once again, helping them to realize the significant contributions that they can make as you have made as a North Carolinian, as a black female um, in this space. Um, you know, so I, 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 I get that question quite a bit. Um, my answer remains the same in that I think that one of the, the key takeaways for me, um, and I, I hope also for um, everyone is that just staying true to yourself is important. And that's really what diversity means in a workplace is that everyone can come to that place and be exactly who they are but still be productive. Um, and so I you noticed my hair has changed in the last week because I just decided that I was done with wearing straight hair because I, I made kind of an unconscious decision to wear straight hair because I have my media appearances over the last year. And then I decided that I was just going to continue to just be me at this point and that I'd proven myself maybe already too much. And so that's the first thing. And being me was um, the reason why I actually was so dedicated to continuing to work on MERS, which is the coronavirus that was circulating in 2014. Uh, the VRC was planning to just discontinue their vaccine program for MERS because it didn't really have a clear cut way to be a product because MERS was taking a downturn. The outbreak was clearly not gonna turn into a pandemic um, uh, of any substantial um, proportion. And so, you know, I was, uh, I, I come from a family of people who have diabetes. My mom, my aunt, honestly, at this point, probably me at some point, but I mean, I'm joking, but just genetically, it's something that is, and if I was gonna be a scientist, I was gonna do something to, even in the slightest way, help my family and, uh, I chose vaccine development because of how interested it is, especially from a virology standpoint. Um, but then there was a paper that came out that MERS uh, was, had better, worse outcomes in people who had diabetes. And then someone followed that up with the, the receptor and on the lungs and people with diabetes are more abundant. And I was like, okay, well, then if I'm gonna work in this place, then I have the ability to work on basically anything that I, I can. You could thank Dr. Collins for that. Like, you know, at NIH, you kind of have that unique ability. And I might as well work on something that at least closely helps my family. And that was me kind of just bringing myself to the table. And um, I think that that's, the, that's really the entire point. Sure, there are going to be countless barriers and you could literally save the world and still have them placed in front of you on a day-to-day -day basis. But um I mean, I'm Christian, so I don't, I don't think there's anything that God can't do through you, right? So that's how I kind of look at it. Thank you. And amen to that, <laughs> Dr. Corbett. <laughs> um, and so I think you're so right. It takes all of us and it has taken all of us, all the differences that we bring to move um, beyond and move to the point that we've gotten. And one thing that COVID-19 has really shown all of us is that we are so interconnected and we have so many uh, similarities. We have differences, but yet we have so many similarities and the contributions that we all bring to um, problem solving is for innovation is at its best and problem solving is at its best. So thank you, Dr. Corbett. Dr. Olick, would you leave us with your key takeaway? Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think for me, what's really struck me is, uh, you know, the example uh, of Dr. Collins in bringing together government and industry uh, to develop and evaluate new vaccines and therapeutics, and just how much we need public-private partnerships for these challenges. Um, and I'm really proud that uh, RTI um, has been in, in investing uh, and will invest in jumpstarting collaboration uh, through the Forethought um, $5 million research collaboration challenge that invites uh, bold visionary proposals. Because this is these types of challenges at this scale 
takes partnership on, uh, on a scale that we really haven't seen before. So the, the vitality and the essential nature of public-private partnerships has been my biggest takeaway. Thank you, so true. Professor Fisher, would you share with us your takeaway? Right, that's, that's the easy question. So the key takeaway, I guess, what goes for a selection of masks goes for pretty much everything. Learn to hone and apply your, your common sense. It's, it's easy to get swept away in, in, in news and in social media wave and on, a, on a certain topic, but you really have to learn how to, how to evaluate information critically and then of course act accordingly. There's, there's so much information out there. Don't, don't be content with what you're fed by any sort of feed or whatever it is. Do your homework in a sense that go out there and actually be curious, see how things work, go to other sources and, and make sure you, you know what you're, what you're broadcasting if you do this on social media. And, and yeah, look around, be curious, um, do your work. Yes, be curious and do your work. Yes, Dr. Schropfer, Schropfer. Share with us your key takeaway. Um, I guess the ability, so um, I've mentioned um, how enormous uh, the information stream has been, and uh, I think other panelists talked about, especially Martin, how difficult it is sometimes to figure out what's right, what's wrong. His paper he mentioned was misquoted. Um, and I think it's just the time to be, I don't know, perhaps more introvert in processing information, in uh, comparing different information resources. I'm an informatics sciences, scientist. And making sense of, of information, making sense of data, separating signal from noise. That really what, uh, what is it all about uh, for kids and for grown kids called adults is how to uh, really learn how to be objective, how to be data-driven, how to be model-derived from data-driven, and how really... <laughs> Um, how to, for me, the, the main message is trust but verify. Trust but verify everything that you hear, everything that you read about, and, uh, um, you know, again, be data-driven and study tools uh, as a data scientist, study tools that help you understand and make sense of data. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to thank all the panelists uh, during this discussion. We're going to move into our Q&A section. And we already have questions coming in. Um, so I will begin the Q&A. The first question is from Habing Wang, who is a, a student journalist and student at uh, North Carolina School of Science and Math. And the question is, how can journalism and news majors contribute to helping out in the COVID-19 effort? And Dr. Olick, I'm gonna turn to you and ask you if you can offer this student some advice about how news majors and journalism can contribute to the COVID-19 effort. Thank you, Secretary Sanders, and thank you for that excellent question. Um, you may have seen in my bio, I'm trained as a, academically as a historian. Uh, I think it's really important that everybody sees that they have a role to play in tackling some of these challenges. And I think what we just heard from, from, from Dr. Thropsha about um, separating signal from the noise and the importance of being able to critically evaluate information and sources and interrogate sources is something that is bread and butter to historians as well as to journalists. So I think uh, going into media or uh, maybe um, I'll try to recruit you to our Center for Communication Science at, at RTI. Um, we need students and young people with background in um, science-based fact reporting um, in our agencies, in our research institutes, and in our universities, and uh, in our media. So you definitely have a role to play. Thank you. Um, Dr. Shropshire, 
how effective are the drugs that have been created to combat COVID-19 in parallel to vaccines that have been produced? All right, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, except for, as you know, remdesivir that was not initially developed for COVID-19, there are no um, drugs specifically developed um, to treat this disease and approved, developed and approved. Uh, there are clinical trials of uh, the Pfizer drug that, that are ongoing, um, which also was initially created uh, against another version of SARS, SARS-1. So uh, we're really talking about how to use current medications to manage this disease. And we're talking about how to, um, you know, back to Francis' talk, uh, one of the most incredible um, observations that he made is how previous science had expedited the development of vac vaccine from so far the fastest 10 years to less than one year. That's the challenge for common drug discovery. And, and, and I continue to maintain that um, drug discovery, small molecule, large molecule drug discovery should not be overshadowed by our ability to develop, develop vaccines for various reasons. They're not effective similarly to all people, they're not 100% effective, and uh, you know we need to continue to uh, develop those treatments. So the challenges are how to develop broad-spectrum direct antiviral compounds, uh, learning from previous antiviral research and maintaining this research, and how to develop host-directed therapies that uh, can, in the long term, protect humans from diseases caused by the viruses, which is a little bit different question. And um, that's a huge broad area. I think we could talk about it forever as to how to um, organize and speed up drug discovery, but um, um, that's sort of looking into the future. That's my answer to this question. Thank you very much. We have another question. As a student, I'm curious, what kind of skills are needed in the area of disease and medicine? What are the most opportune fields of study what kind of education will the future scientists and researchers pursue? Dr. Corbett, would you mind ask, answering that question for us, please? So I, I um, might not be the best person to answer that question because despite the fact that I have a PhD in microbiology and immunology, I have explored all corners of all subjects in any way that I can. <laughs> um, I was just, I was that person. And I, I kind of rounded out by majoring in biology and uh, have a double major in sociology, mostly because of influence of professors uh, and not necessarily with the end goal in mind, because it is, it is my feeling that the best scientists are people who can think critically and anyone who can think critically about anything, whether it be history or I don't know, English lit probably could end up at the end of the day being a very productive scientist. Um, obviously there are basic levels of virology and all these other things that you have to understand, but the key is to learn how to think critically first and then to focus your energy on what will be your niche. And that is the virology or immunology or whatever and what have you. Um, and so, you know, the general, pipeline, which I am also writing an article, uh, a commentary right now that is called Dismantling the Pipeline, because I think it is just something that has to happen in order for us to really pick up um, the most talent along the way. But nevertheless, I, if you're thinking about the, the, the traditional pipeline, most people go about doing things by majoring in a science in undergrad, and then getting a terminal degree also related to health. So whether it be public health or an MD or um, a biology-based PhD, that's, that's generally how people go about it. Um, although I am, I'm again, probably not the best person to ask because I'm trying to revolutionize that in, in some many ways, but yeah. Thank you, Dr. Corbett. I can't wait to hear more about dismantling the pipeline. That sounds very interesting. <laughs> Take it away, throw it out. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, the next question um, that we have 
uh, that says, states, given all the knowledge and experiences we have gained from dealing with COVID-19 pandemic, how prepared would we be from a societal and scientific standpoint to deal with such an event in the future? And so, um, Dr. Fisher, Professor Fisher, I'm going to ask you if you would uh, give us your response on that one. <laughs> Uh, I'm probably the, the least qualified of all the panelists here to answer this question. Um, this is, I, I'm just going to echo what, uh, what Francis Collins said this morning. Um, mixing politics and public health is an exceptionally bad idea, right? This is, this is really changing the mindset of people. When I see folks that, that refuse to wear masks, that refuse to get vaccines, well, how do you change the mind of these people, right? It's, it's it's partly it, it's what you're being told right it's it's, it's a political question for which i don't have the answer to so i i probably passed this question on to whoever wants to chime in because that's a question that there is no easy answer from my side yeah uh, dr schrotzer or corbett or dr olick or or we're gonna go with you professor fisher and um of course, all these questions can be discussed forever and probably many different perspectives. Um, so I hope everyone is just enjoying and appreciating the responses that, that we have in this limited uh, time. Okay. So I have a, a, another question and um, Professor Fisher, I'm gonna go back to you on this one. As a high school teacher in Western North Carolina, many of my students do not believe in the efficacy of masks. They are reluctant to wear them properly and are very vocal about their perceived uselessness. What is a good way to convince them that the masks are essential to combating this virus if they're unwilling to believe in research? If I only knew the answer to that. So <laughs> I, I've seen um, Twitter feeds with videos of somebody vaping and having a surgical mask and stuff going out left and right. Um, sure, if you, if you, it looks very impressive, right? It looks, it looks like the mask doesn't do anything, but I can, I can show you other videos that show exactly the opposite. I mean, the fact that when you, when you speak that there's stuff coming out and that the mask actually stops these particles, it might not be as, as flashy. You might not get as, as much attention, um, but it is, it is science-based um, video, science-based facts. And how do you make people believe in science? I'm working on that every day, right? It's a, it's a matter of getting the message out and trying to combat these, these fake science posts or, or videos, but it's, it's an uphill battle. Yeah. I'm gonna answer, uh, we have time for maybe a few more questions. And this one is um, panelists, please, um, Dr. Shropshire, I'm thinking I'm gonna turn this one to you, but if there's someone else that feels more uh, comfortable answering. The panelists have talked about how past research about coronaviruses and messenger RNA was useful to expedite the vaccine production process. What parts of that were directly applicable to COVID? And what were the main new things they had to be discovered? Also, how in a similar way can we use current knowledge to apply to future pandemics, which I think we discussed that some earlier in preparation for future pandemics. So Dr. Schwabscher or Dr. Corbett? I really think that's for Dr. Corbett because I think that she had actually talked about hinders and mirrors. So I think that's yes. directly Corbett? to her. Yeah, sure. I can, I'll an answer the first one and then I'll have you repeat or maybe redefine the second question. But um, it, the first question is, the, the thing, so in science, what happens is knowledge continues to build on each other, right? So I, people are like, oh, you have a 95% efficacious vaccine. You can go and just all things happen after that. But then comes a million and five questions like what happened to the five percent of people who didn't get it protected and those kinds of things and so that's what's been happening for the last x 
20 years or so with mRNA and for sure for the last six years in regards to how we have been understanding MERS, we basically have been asking question on top of question. So we got to the point where we understood that the spike protein, which is that protein that Dr. Collins uh, pointed to on, on, his, on his slides, can be delivered by the messenger RNA. We got to the point where we knew exactly what preclinical or animal doses we, could, we would test to prove its utility towards a human. We got to that point and we knew exactly how to design that protein. So we knew that and everything else that was to come after that is what was the discoveries for the COVID that were COVID specific. So, um, you know, we followed a similar model, um, but all of the clinical aspects of the, of the vaccine relevance to COVID was, was new. Um, we had no idea whether it would work. We actually didn't know what doses to use in the clinic. I, that that's why there's this large dose range in the phase one clinical trial. And so those kinds of things. And then the second question, I don't think I understood. Um, it was basically how in a similar way can we use the current knowledge to apply to ah. future pandemic? Oh, all types of ways. <laughs> so there are about, there, actually there are exactly 24 uh, viral families that can infect a human or have the potential to infect a human. That is coronaviruses, influenza, et cetera. So all of these viral families are just hanging out in nature somewhere, potentially poised to jump into humans and cause this level of destruction. And if we could do the same exercise for each viral family in the same way that we did it for coronaviruses, we could, we would obviously spend billions of dollars, but if we could drive a, a vaccine product into a phase one clinical trial and get phase one clinical trial data for each of the viral families by a, a mRNA vaccine candidate, I think that we would be in good shape around pandemic preparedness in full. So that approach is called the prototype pathogen approach. And what that means is that you pick a, a, one of the cousins in the family, so one of the viruses in the viral family, and you make a vaccine for it. And you prove that, that vaccine might work for another vaccine uh, a virus in that family. And so um, I think that that has so much utility, aside from the fact, not only that, but messenger RNA has utility for because of its rapid manufacturability and reliable manufacturability to be able to deliver multiple things. So antibody therapies that are um, kind of hanging out in the back burner at this point, but they could actually, you could deliver antibodies via messenger RNA and, and use messenger RNA more prophylactically. So before someone was to get sick. So those are the kinds of utilities for, for messenger RNA. I know because we have been reached reached out by several startup companies that are taking their own various approaches to give me so I know that there are dozens of companies that are popping up and everyone is really interested in their own approach to messenger RNA. So I'm very excited about the future of the technology in full and how it's going to drive forward other technologies as well. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have this last question and um, then close out. Um, Dr. Oleg, I'll, I'm going to tap you on this one. I know RTI International has extensive experience in addressing public health threats and, um, and lots of data and research there. This is with reference to rapid testing technology. And basically, do you anticipate that there will continue to be innovations in rapid testing technology now that vaccines are becoming more widely available, um, what are your thoughts? Do you think we're gonna to continue to see innovations in this space? Sure. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about uh, back to uh, what Dr. Francis Collins uh, spoke with us about earlier about the kind of the, the, the threefold, the diagnostics, the therapeutics and, and the vaccines. And, you know, we need inclusive innovation in all of those uh, in, in all of those realms um, uh, going forward. So uh, I, I would like to think, uh, I, I would like to think the answer is yes. And with, uh, with all of us working together, uh, I think uh, there'll continue to be innovations in that space. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all the panelists for your participation and 
um, insights that you share. Thank everyone who participated in and asking questions. Um, and so I want to uh, say that this is an exciting time in science with the rapid development and deployment of three safe and effective vaccines. Last week, North Carolina received 80,000 doses of Johnson & Johnson one-shot vaccine. The third vaccine means that North Carolina can get more people vaccinated sooner and means keeping people out of the hospital and preventing deaths from the pandemic. And so we are excited about uh, the progress and going forward. And we continue to put our efforts forth to, to reach everyone, especially those marginalized and underserved communities. Um, Governor Cooper is continuing to advocate for more vaccines in the state. But as we wait for the, to meet the demand, we have those three W's that remain our best tools to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our neighbors. So I ask everyone to please continue to wear a mask, wait six feet apart, and wash your hands frequently. And as our Secretary of Human and Health Services in North Carolina, Dr. Mandy Cohen often says, whatever your reason, get behind the mask. So thank you all so much. I'd like to thank the School of Math and Science for this opportunity. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Mr. Holden Thorpe. Thank you, Secretary Sanders, and thanks to the extraordinary panel, uh, Dr. Corbett, Dr. Tropsha, Dr. Fisher, and Dr. Olick. It's great to see all of you. Uh, and uh, Secretary, thank you for your leadership in getting so many people vaccinated in North Carolina and so many other things. Um, now we're going to have a, um, another terrific talk from another wonderful uh, leader in science in North Carolina and around the world. Before I introduce her though, I just want to remind everyone that there are outstanding workshops after this that uh, uh, everyone should stay on for and uh, lots of other exciting things to do uh, with your colleagues uh, as it relates to uh, COVID and everything we've been talking about. But now it's my uh, privilege to introduce Dr. Cindy Gay, who is a associate professor of medicine at the University of North Carolina. She is part of um, a team at UNC that is uh, one of the great jewels in medical science in the world uh, that works on infectious diseases. Uh, they have been leaders in HIV where they developed uh, many of the protocols uh, that are used to manage HIV through clinical trials that they did around the world and especially at a very special place that I've had the privilege to visit in Malawi, uh, where many of the uh, most important HIV studies were done. You're going to get to hear from Dr. Gay about how she uh, got to where she is and how she uh, does this kind of clinical research around the world. She got her undergraduate degree at Duke University. She got her MPH and her MD at the University of North Carolina. As uh, I said, she's on the faculty there in medicine. She is the medical director of the HIV Cure Center, which is a, another great topic. If you wanna have another symposium, she could tell us a lot about HIV latency and how we might actually progress to a cure for HIV and not just managing it with medicine the way we do now. But like many researchers, she pivoted to COVID and has been a PI on the Moderna trial. And she is a PI and the co-chair on the trial for the Novavax vaccine, which just announced the last couple of days, outstanding data from the United Kingdom and is moving towards uh, completing a trial in the United States as uh, Francis Collins just said. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce my former colleague and great leader, Dr. Cindy Gay. Great, thanks so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can let me know if it's, let me. Great, am I good? Hopefully. Um, I um, just am incredibly, honored to be here today. I hope you all recognize what a truly remarkable esteemed group of people you've heard from today. 
um, I just feel, you know, incredibly um, honored that I was asked. Um, today, I've titled the talk At Risk, The Challenge of, of COVID-19 Vaccine Trials, in part because uh, my journey with all this started probably the end of the spring in 2020. And the word risk just kept coming up in so many ways, both in clinical care and in these vaccine trials. And hopefully by the end, I'm going to have you thinking that risk is not always a bad thing, that it can be a great motivator. Um, before I launch on all of that, I want to talk or, or describe what a clinical trial is, because I'm going to talk about that a lot. And that's kind of what I'm going to frame on. In part, what I'm going to tell you over uh, the next few minutes is a little bit of a story of how it is that I came to be asked and I'm talking to you um, today. Um, and a lot of that includes just my experience. I also want to frame this more of a story versus sort of what I typically do, which is go, kind of go through boring data and numbers and et cetera, um, to help you think about what a career in uh, clinical trials might actually look like. What, what could it be? Um, part because of where you are and part maybe to inspire you because um, we need people with um, energy and passion and, and um, critical thinkers, as other people have said. So what is a clinical trial? A clinical trial is a research study in which one or more human participants are assigned to one or more interventions to evaluate their effects. For the rest of the talk, I'm really going to be focusing on vaccines, but this could be either a drug, which is what I think most people are, are used to. It could also be a clinical trial of a device can it even be a clinical trial of something that tries to change behavior? Um, really, you're just trying to answer a question of does something work? So I'm gonna sort of back up to a real big picture. This is a, a slide that Barney Grant from the NIH shared with me and I've kind of mucked around with a little bit. The title of the slide seems a little daunting, the deadliest pandemics in history, but I really just wanna make a couple of points and hopefully uh, have a somewhat positive uh, take on all of it. What you see are by size, the largest is the, the virus that had the, the highest um, uh, deaths associated with the pandemic and going over time. And I wanna make a couple of, uh, hone in a couple. Smallpox is a really interesting pandemic for a lot of reasons. One, it was the second deadliest pandemic in our history. The other is that it was the first um, uh, infection, if you will, to have a vaccine developed for it. It also is incredibly not notable because it is the only disease that we have wiped out from the planet. And that's largely due to having a vaccine for it. So I want to sort of put a exclamation point on, on the end of that statement about what um, vaccines can do, how effective they can be and how they can really benefit us. The other um, pandemic, which is highlighted in the blue rectangle is the HIV pandemic, which up until a year ago, I had spent my entire career focusing on it is, has been a very deadly pandemic in part because it's ongoing. It doesn't sort of um, have a, a, a pandemic that lasts a year or two, doesn't sort of run its course. It sort of hangs out in the body. And so we have uh, a lot of people still living with HIV. A lot of people are still getting it. But the thing that I kind of really wanna make the biggest point on is on this version of the slide where all of the pandemics and outbreaks that you see highlighted in red, these have all occurred during my lifetime. I think we all sort of fall into this mindset that pandemics are something quite extraordinarily, that why is this happening? This shouldn't be happening. But in fact, if you look at the slide over our sort of whole history, they do recur and they're going to happen again. So we remain at risk for that because these viruses and bacteria, they evolve as we evolve and, and our lives are changing due to globalization and travel and climate change. And so these are going to change with us. However, I would say, if you look at the ones that have sort of occurred most recently, they do tend to cause less death. So I think we are learning things. The big challenge is lear learning, or what can we learn from these pandemics? Um, can we allow technology that Dr. Collins and others have talked about and motivation, which means people, um, allow us to respond better? What else do we learn about these pandemics? In my own opinion, I think in particular, uh, the most recent HIV and the COVID pandemic, they uncover some ugly truths about inequities and who um, bears the burden of these. Can we be better and respond to those in between the pandemics so that they don't have the same uh, disproportionate effect? So flashing back to the year 2000, which is before you were born, I was in my second year of residency. I was already kind of knew that I was gonna do infectious diseases. And at that time, were really the dark days of the HIV pandemic. We did. We had only recently, a few years before, um, 
figured out how what really effective treatment was going to be like, but it wasn't available to everybody in the United States, and it certainly wasn't effective or sorry available to other people in other more resource poor settings. So I took an elective during my residency, and I went to Botswana, which um, was the wealthiest country in Africa. They at that time did not have any treatment for HIV, and I spent some time in a hospital there working with the other healthcare providers. And it was, you know, sort of to use the quote, very eye-opening and was really me seeing what this was like, that the hospitals were overrun with extraordinarily sick people. They were dying every day. The healthcare workers were exhausted. They were demoralized because they didn't have anything to offer. And there was a sense of hopelessness. Sounds sort of familiar, doesn't it? So it was really sort of understanding in a much more tangible way what the risk of not doing anything about that was. And at that time, there were people saying it couldn't be done. We couldn't roll out HIV treatment into such rural sort of uh, places with, le with uh, lack of infrastructure. But there were a lot of people said, yeah, we can. Um, and we decided, um, and I decided at that time that I really couldn't look back and HIV was gonna be my thing. So it's similar, like they're big problem, big risk. A lot of people need help and making a career decision based on that. After residency, I spent some time and worked with Doctors Without Borders. And this was when I landed in a tiny town in Uganda. They didn't even have a street light. There were 20 people who had been started on treatment. And one of the things I started to understand then was that although we think of Doctors Without Borders as a humanitarian organization, they were starting to collect data. They were smart enough and had a database. And I spent a lot of hours adding data into that. And the idea was that they were gonna to have to show that this worked, that's research. If you're gonna do a program or roll something out, you need to show that it's gonna be effective and you need to be able to show that data to other people. So that was a big moment for me. I love seeing patients. I, I have a clinic, I see patients in the hospital, but there's so many times where you realize, oh gosh, oh, if only we had that, or um, oh, wouldn't it be great if we had treatment or how can we get treatment out to people faster? And the way that you do that is through research. It's by making big advances that eventually would trickle down to the individual people that are in front of you. So dark days of the HIV pandemic, how do people respond? It wasn't me at the time, but some really smart people figured out that if you wanted to answer questions and specifically about what works, um, you need, a, or you could do it a lot faster if you have a lot of different sites doing it at the same time. I Meaning if we were only doing a study at UNC, it might take a long time to get hundreds of patients enrolled on a study so we could eventually have the answer. We didn't have time for that. So a lot of people got together and decided, well, we'd have one study, but you'd enroll it across multiple sites. And what you see on this map are now where some of the AIDS clinical trial sites are that started back then, still going on today, and are largely responsible for the fact that we have effective treatment now that allows people to pretty much live a normal life. An offshoot of that was there was also an HIV vaccine trials network that was focusing just on trying to get an HIV vaccine like we are now for COVID. And there was a whole nother network that was focusing on how do we prevent HIV? And then for um, another network that also focuses on other vaccines because they cause a lot of uh, death and morbidity um, from flu, from um, diarrheal diseases that primarily affect children in resource poor countries. And what happened back early in the COVID pandemic, we were all figuring out, well, well how am I going to do remote learning? How am I going to do remote learning for my kids? Some very dedicated people decided we needed to bring all of those networks together and they formed something called the COVID-19 Prevention Network. Why this relates to me is at a certain point in my career, I had great mentors who sort of said, you know, here, you, you should work on this, this trial and with uh, the AIDS Clinical Trials Group. And I did that. And over time, I became a site PI for several studies through the AIDS clinical trials group, the vaccine trials, and the HIV prevention trials, such that when we realized we were going to be able to have some vaccines that we could roll out and do these phase three studies, I had already worked with this group. I knew these people, they knew me, and they sort of offered me this opportunity to be a co-chair on the Novavax, Novavax vaccine trial. Um, I would say there was risk with that, both with being the site PI for Moderna, it meant long hours, it meant weekends, it meant less time with my family. Um, but I felt like the risk was worth it. It also meant coming in and, you know, seeing people on a regular basis that were at risk for COVID or they were diagnosed with it and we needed to bring them back in and get them tested. For Novavax, I would say from a career perspective, it was risky because um, a lot of people were going to be watching what I did. And it, um, these vaccine trials are under a microscope. So it was like, well, it's, it's a risky thing, but at the end of the day, I felt like it was my opportunity to help out. It was a service role, essentially, that I could provide in helping us all get to a better place. 
So I, um, uh, Dr. Thorpe sort of mentioned earlier, my other role has been working with the, the sort of on HIV cure for the last 10 years, and that was kind of also a risk, but I'm going to throw it out to sort of help, help you think about making choices uh, going forward. Um, about 10 years ago, I was sort of pivoting from doing work in, uh, internationally because for family reasons mostly, um, and some of my um, colleagues came to me and said, hey, why don't you help be sort of the person who oversees clinical trials that we're doing related to HIV cure? And this is mostly working with scientists who are in the lab coming up with these new ideas. Um, and I've learned a tremendous amount from them. But at the time I was like, you know, I only understand what you're saying about half of the time. I don't know that I can actually really do this. But they believed in me and they said, you can, you can learn this. So my role with this group is in taking, when they have something that's new and promising, my role is to help design a study um, and then conduct it, implement it, and sort of translate what, what's happening in labs and um, with these basic scientists into clinical trials and people. So this also sort of prepared me for this role with the Nipivax vaccine trials because I had experience with phase one and phase two studies in this work. So let's talk about that. Um, there's been a lot in the news about the phase one, phase two, phase three with this COVID vaccine trial. So let's break it down a little bit so you understand it. Um, uh, Dr. Corbett talked about sort of the preclinical work, which would be the, the trials that, or the work you would do in a lab and also in animals. And once that looks good, it's safe. And for example, you have an idea what sort of dose you wanna do, it would go into a phase one trial. So this is a, when you're actually trying your new vaccine or an adapted vaccine, in people, your primary concern is showing that it's safe. And you may look at varying doses. Oftentimes you're starting with lower doses and you really think you might want so that you can show it's safe to safe and kind of incrementally increase the dose till you sort of get where you want to be. If you if the if that's found to be safe and looks good, you could then move into the phase two trial. This is also looking at safety in more people, so sort of a few hundred. And you're usually also going to see if the vaccine is doing what you want it to do, which is eliciting these antibody responses that you heard about. And you can even measure the levels. If that looks to be good, safe, it's well tolerated, and the vaccine looks like it's doing what we want it to do, then you can move into a phase three study. This is sort of the hallmark and this, the kind of study you would have to do to get something licensed and approved by the FDA so that it could be prescribed or even something you could buy over the counter. These studies are usually called, they're usually placebo controlled, which means some of the people in the vaccine are getting the actual, in the study are getting the vaccine and some people are getting a placebo. So you can see if there's a difference between those two arms and usually they're blinded, meaning they don't know which one they got and the people doing the study don't know either. So everybody's treated the same. For these studies, you often need thousands of people. And for these vaccine trials, we did had tens of thousands of people trying to get an answer as quickly as we could. And in general, you want people to be at risk for the thing. So we wanted people to be at some risk for COVID and how that was defined was kind of varied a little bit, but, and also changed over time with these studies. So the question I get the most often was, were the steps missed or, or why are these vaccines uh, available so quickly um, with some concerns about trust? So I like this figure because it sort of breaks it down in the easiest way possible. On the top bar um, is sort of what you see is the typical process and it's color coded by those phases that I talked about with the farthest on the left, almost black being the preclinical in animals and in the lab. The Duke blue would be the phase one, the UNC blue phase two, the lightest blue phase three. And then that muddy brown color would be the manufacturing that you would do after you found your vaccine was effective and safe. And then the yellow sort of distributing it. So if you go to the bar below that, that sort of Tip, sort of what happened with these COVID vaccine trials. The big picture is all of those colors are still there, right? They've been condensed. And as Dr. Corbett said, a lot of it was because we took out a lot of the steps that usually have to happen because we're not in such a hurry. Um, the two biggest reasons why things happen faster were technology and resources. And what falls into resources would be funding and people. And by people, I mean a lot of people with the expertise and experience to know how to do and already know how and are doing clinical trials and how to make it go a little bit faster. So what you can see, and also the phase one, two, there was some overlapping, meaning in the phase one study, when we had enough safety data on the people in that study to show that it was safe and tolerated, we could go ahead and begin to start the phase two. Same thing with the, the, the phase two, phase three, a little overlapping. And as you can also see, the manufacturing started at the beginning of the phase two study. So at risk, meaning we didn't know if the vaccines were gonna be effective, but we needed to be prepared to make them if they were. 
So a lot of this was happening um, at risk. We use that word a lot in these COVID vaccine trials, meaning at risk because we didn't know exactly when they were going to start because they were going to start as soon as the vaccine was ready, et cetera. So on this um, slide, you see all the human clinical trials with COVID, vaccine, uh, COVID vaccines in the United States. And I wrote about this op opportunity because as I mentioned back in the, the sort of March, I was just trying to help my colleagues figure out how we were gonna take care of patients with COVID in the hospital. And I was asked to be a PI or a site PI for the Moderna study as we were selected for a site. So my role for that was to oversee the conduct of the study at UNC and it has some challenges and I'm gonna talk about that. And then it was asked to be um, the, as I mentioned, a co-chair for the Novavax study. What's similar about all of these vaccines, and Dr. Collins and others talked about this, they're all similar in the sense that they're all trying to elicit a vaccine response to the same target, that spike protein. And I'm gonna quickly review that. They're different in the technology and the way that it was done, and they're, um, which Dr. Collins also went over, but they're all targeting the same protein. So let's quickly go over that because I think you got a pretty good idea before. So here on the left is the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus. And we've already talked about the spike protein that sits on the outside. Um, and again, in a review, what's critical about this protein is that the SARS-CoV-2 virus has to use this protein to bind to something called an ACE2 receptor on our cells. And it's that binding that allows the virus to get inside our cells. As mentioned earlier, all viruses have to get on, uh, inside our cells to use our own cell machinery to make more virus. That's what causes infection. So if you only present the spike protein, um, one, you can't cause infection, none of the vaccines can do that, but this is critical um, to having antibodies to this spike protein, right? Because it can't do its thing if we block this. So here's kind of an idea, don't be too amazed with my graphics, um, but the idea is you give someone just that spike protein, your body makes these antibodies that bind and recognize it. And then after the vaccination, you have these antibodies in your blood and in your tissue. And when exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, they're there and they, can, they also, um, as Dr. Collins mentioned, sort of stimulate a process to quickly make more. And as you can see, this sort of physically interrupts the ability of that spike protein to bind to the receptor so you can't get in, can't cause infection or causes less severe infection. That's the idea. So what's the big picture? Instead of going through all of the sort of data from the three vaccines that are now um, approved for um, by emergency youth authorization, I wanted to do a big picture because I think it makes it simpler. And I want you to be able to think about this and also talk to your friends and families and encourage people to get a vaccine. So on the left is sort of a cartoon about, but in essence, sort of a, the, a kind of figure we would use in these studies where you have the number of COVID cases going up vertically and then what you wanna see is that there's a big difference in the number of people who get COVID between those who got the placebo, right? Not the vaccine and those who got the vaccine. And the joke is I always try to get data that's good enough that you don't need to do statistics. That's uh, appealing to me because I'm not very good at statistics. But the big picture is that thus far, all of these vaccines prevent severe disease and they prevent COVID-19 death. It would be great if they also prevent sort of mild disease, but that's not really what we care about. We wanna be able to prevent people from getting severe disease, having to be in the hospital, and we of course wanna prevent people from dying. So all of the data is very, is very encouraging. We do have to, uh, to worry about the variants with some people I've mentioned, but I'm not gonna get into that. It's too complicated, don't have enough time. And thus far, there are no safety concerns at all. The symptoms and some of the side effects we see with these vaccines are really typical of all vaccines, including those that are licensed. And here, just to show you, it's not, it's sort of a joke, but not a joke, because here uh, that I've just shown up is a figure from, that was published on the Pfizer vaccine, showing you the number of cases in blue and the people in that study who got the placebo compared to those who got the actual um, vaccine, uh, which is kind of a steady flat line on, on the, in red. Pretty amazing. And I would agree with Dr. Collins that these efficacy of these vaccines uh, is far greater than I think anything that my, certainly myself or my colleagues were hoping for. So I mentioned earlier that what, what do pandemics teach us? And as I mentioned, I think sometimes they make us look at some uh, ugly truths that we were kind of ignoring. And um, these are some figures from North Carolina, but, but similar things can be shown across all the other states about how certain groups bore a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 illness and death. Um, in addition, those over the age of 65 were also uh, found to be at um, higher risk for disease and severe disease and death. 
Um, but I think it raises the point that in, in essence, we sort of knew some of these inequities were there, but we weren't doing anything about them. This came into play when we were just making decisions about how we were gonna do these studies at UNC. And there were certainly many other um, uh, and this investigators who were thinking about this across the United States and, and other places where they're doing these studies. We decided that we had a moral and an ethical obligation to make the participation in these studies reflect how it was um, affecting the people in our community. So we put a priority and made a commitment to first trying to enroll people at risk so they could potentially benefit from being on the study, but also to um, have it reflect uh, Black and African Americans in our community and Hispanics. That required some additional work for the reasons mentioned, there's a lot of mistr mistrust with some of these um, communities for good reason. Um, we haven't always reached out to them to be in research studies. We haven't always done a good job with that. Um, and we had not a lot of time to do it because of the pace uh, that we were being asking to roll on the studies. So what did we do? Here, um, I'm just gonna focus on these two at UNC just to give you a flavor, but understand that across more than hundred sites for each of these studies, they were enrolling. Overall, all of the vaccine studies that I showed on that first table enrolled uh, somewhere between 30 to 40,000 participants in very short amount of time. So in the Moderna study at UNC, as you can see, we enrolled 174 participants in about two months. Uh, we had about two months to prepare for that where we would normally have somewhere between six to eight months. I'm very proud of our team and you can see sort of the breakdown of the demographics that we were able to enroll um, on the study here at UNC. Um, I think we did a tremendous job and we're quite proud of that, I would say. For the Novavax study, which um, again, this IPI and a co-chair, we enrolled 271 participants in about six weeks. Um, I know it's kind of hard to imagine really what that looks like, but for each enrollment it takes about two to two and a half hours because you have to go over something called informed consent with people. It's about a 20 page document explaining to them what's, what, what they're gonna be asked to do, what the risks are, um, that it's voluntary, et cetera. And we really make sure people understand what it is that they're signing up for. So if you can envision, it's also COVID. Um, we don't have all of the staff here coming into to the office and into the clinics to help us do the study. A lot of them are remote. Uh, we don't have all the space we would normally want because of COVID restrictions. And even within that space we have, we have some places where you can't bring people who might have COVID because of all the concerns about transmission. So since about June, our, our, our challenge and getting these uh, trials off the ground was a lot about problem solving, a lot about my team who are um, could win any survival contest about how to do research. Um, it was almost daily we were having to try to figure out how to get around COVID restrictions, how to reach out to these communities, how to do it in a respectful way and try to establish some trust. And the other challenge we had was about the time we were starting to roll on Novavax, the Moderna study or the Moderna vaccine had gotten emergency youth authorization so we were unblinding people and bringing them back in to get vaccinated. So we were juggling those two things at the same time, um, but both were equally important to us because we wanted everybody who had really been brave and a hero for us to sign up for the Moderna study to come in and get vaccinated as soon as we possibly could. Um, so it was just uh, kind of crazy. So I'm gonna talk in the last few minutes and I hope I'm not going over too long, but how do we do that in ways that were new? So again, talking about problem solving. Back in June, we realized we were gonna have this problem with space. Like how could we even bring in um, all these people to enroll them on a study and do it safely for them and protect our staff? So we found some retail space and leased uh, and, and actually put down a three-year lease for this space because we knew we just needed it. We have no idea where we were gonna have enough studies to really make it financially feasible for the next three years. So why did we do it? We did it at risk because we just needed to. We realized that it was just such a, um, that we just had to get these vaccines. We, you know, we had to show whether they were effective or not. Another thing we did sort of getting back to our commitment to reaching out to communities uh, that were being hard hit was we decided we would try to take the vaccine study to people in these communities. So also thinking about the idea of trust, we have some colleagues who've been doing work for many years in Siler City, it's about 45 minutes from here. It's about 50% Hispanic and also has a large proportion of black and African Americans. Um, and they have been working there. They had trust with these, this community and these, these people. So the CoVPN provided us this crazy like rock band looking van that is fitted on the inside with a small area for a pharmacy where we could prep the vaccines. 
um, a place where we could um, process blood samples that we're collecting and even like little clinic rooms. So we took that van to Siler City and we set up outside the free clinic where they're providing free healthcare and try to sort of build on that trust and um, bring the vaccine study to a place that we knew was being hard hit. There are a lot of manufacturing plants um, in Siler City that we knew um, had very high rates of COVID. So what else did I find myself? Oh, and to get back, um, this whole idea about reaching out and some things that we did for these vaccine studies that were really new was the COVIDBN created a website, one that provided um, information, education, also at sort of a level that, that um, most people can understand and breaking some of this down. But they also created this COVIDBN registry that wasn't specific to any site. But if people were interested in, a, in either a vaccine or even a, a sort of a therapeutic trial of COVID, they could go in and put their information. And one of the things that was really helpful to my site and many others is that it would ask you some questions, sort of what might be your risk for actually acquiring COVID and it would also ask for some demographics. And so it helped us be able to sort of prioritize those who were at the most risk and would thus potentially benefit from being on the study and also be able to prioritize these groups that I talked about that were being disproportionately impacted in our own community. And then just sort of another off the wall thing that uh, we realized we had very little time and that we needed to one, have a way to reach out to Spanish speaking individuals um, and how we were gonna do that. So I worked with a company that helped, um, this is what they do. They create small videos around uh, um, educational public health things. And they created specific videos in English and Spanish to talk about what is a research trial? What is that, what is that about? And then specifically about the COVID vaccines. And um, we played this in the, in the places in Siler City sort of routinely um, so they could break it down in a, in a way that's like visually um, appealing and more interesting than just me dragging on about it. And that's just kind of another uh, uh, picture of what the video sort of looked like. And the last thing, I think that this is my last slide. The last thing we did, it goes back to a point that Dr. Collins made is that um, Part of my role, I felt, was at some point less about enrolling on the trials and more about trying to provide confidence and trust in these vaccines and how the studies were being done. I'm an introvert by nature, but I accepted every request for an interview with the news on the trials and, um, because I felt like it was the right thing to do. But understanding that my message is different. I'm uh, a white physician and I'm working with the studies. So we asked some really great people who enrolled in our study to talk about why they would do that. And we sort of sought out for people who would look like those we wanted to think about being in research or understand why we were reaching out to them. And you see a lot of them on the slide. Sort of the one exception is a white guy down in the bottom left corner who's Ralph Barrick, who is um, sort of internationally an international expert on SARS-CoV-2. My personal here is Pastor Nichols here. He enrolled on the study without us really even knowing who he was or what he did. And then he decided to take a video and show it to his congregation about why he was doing it and why it was important for um, uh, predominantly black people in his community. And then invited us on a waste Facebook webinar to talk to his congregation and others about it. So a lot of uh, kind of crazy stuff. I know I was a little all over the place, but that's kind of what it's been like for the last eight months. So I wanna thank you for your attention and being asked to present with all these wonderful people and I can't help but get on my soapbox for one more sentence to say, please get vaccinated when you can, both for you and your community. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Cindy, for a great tour of what you've been doing and the challenges and the inspiration uh, that uh, you are able to bring to so many people about how we can confront these things. So we've got another round of student questions and we're gonna start with Hannah. Hello, Dr. Gay. My name is Hannah Geber-Michael, and my question is, what were some of the unexpected challenges of clinical research? Yeah, I think I had a, a few of those. You know, I would say one of our challenges was we realized we were going to be asked to enroll more participants more quickly than we normally would. So we were, you know, hiring staff as fast as we could because we knew we were going to need more help. And that was hard because, you know, back in the spring and the summer, um, there was only a core group of us that were actually coming into the office. So we were learning how to communicate with each other. Um, I would tell you, I mentioned I'm an introvert, but I learned to ask a lot of favors. I learned to ask a lot of favors of people on high. I didn't really care anymore <laughs> if I was bugging them or being a nuisance. But, you know, the reason you do that is because, you know, the, the need was so great. You know, we just 
problem solved all the time. I mentioned the space that we needed to find a space that would be more convenient, but also safer for people. So they would feel okay coming into clinic because people were even nervous about that, about coming out of their house and into sort of um, a clinic space, you know, and back in with the Moderna study in particular, but also when things got really bad um, in January. So we had to create a space where people would feel comfortable to come. Um, and also, you know, I would say it was a challenge to even make our staff feel safe. We had to, we had to do a lot um, with that. Um, there was the challenge of the pressure. Uh, we were asked to really enroll people as quickly as, as possible. So there was a balance, uh, there was some um, of me talking to myself about how to balance the pressure of what they were asking us to do, but you know, keeping my staff happy enough that they were going to continue to show up um, and not be, you know, um, burned out. So there were, you know, a lot of frequent check-ins to make sure that we were doing everything as fast as we could, but in the right way across all of those particular issues. Does that answer it well enough? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, of course, great question. Thank you, Hannah, great question. And now Divya. Um, hello, Dr. Gay, my name is Divya. So since people of color are at a greater risk of having underlying health conditions, how did Moderna address racial disparities in the clinical trials regarding the effectiveness and presented symptoms given the rapid development of the vaccine? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and this was really, I think, a, a journey for me and many others about how we were going to make sure. I'm going to, I'm going to, if it's okay with you, I'm going to answer it in an even bigger way. That's not just applicable to Moderna. Mm -hmm. I would say the one thing that was also unique about these studies was that it was such a collaboration of different groups overseeing them, meaning there was the COVPN, which I mentioned, because that was sort of my role was to support those sites. But the NIH, and, and, I, and by the NIH, I mean like the best of the best from the NIH, there's a group called BARDA that sort of oversees research um, uh, and the government a, a little bit. Um, but it, 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 all of these groups were kind of overseeing it. And it was the input of all of the sort of leadership across those groups that understood that making participation in these studies was going to be important. It was, again, you know, an oral, uh, no oral, a, a moral and ethical sort of reason to do it. But I think they also really thought early on that it was going to be important that when we had the results of the studies, that people were going to need to see that people like them were in the studies, that we were going to need to have this participation. We also knew that these, these trials are going to be under the microscope like nothing else with the clinical trials. And then again, people needed to see that people were thinking about them, or that we were thinking about who was being impacted. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really do us a service to have a vaccine that people don't want to get. And if they don't see um, that people like them were included it, they'll wonder like, well, is it gonna work for us? Or why didn't they include us when we're being um, so impacted? So I would say the, I might get in trouble with this. I think the pharmaceutical companies were thinking less about it because that's sort of less their traditional mission. And it was in my opinion, uh, a great service that the way these trials uh, rolled out was with all this collaboration of people. One of the reasons why they brought the COVID-P insights in is that we, because we had done so much work with HIV clinical trials, we had this history of reaching out to some of these communities. HIV is um, traditionally impacted um, uh, more um, African-Americans, also Hispanic, also the LGBTQ community. So we had a, um, history, we have groups, we have people who focus on engaging those. And so I think it was the understanding that we kind of knew how to do that, that it's not just kind of like, oh, yeah, we're going to tick that box. That's, you know, because somebody says we have to, that we're really passionate about it, that we feel it's the right thing to do. Um, so I, I think all, all of that was one, a rec recognition that it was important. And then one, a commitment, you've got to have people who are willing to do sometimes the hard work um, to make it happen. Thank you. Terrific, thank you, Divya. And now, Akshra. Dr. Gay, my name is Akshra Paimagam and I'm actually stepping in to ask Shrieker Kampala's question, which is how do Moderna and other companies that have produced vaccines plan on being involved in communicating the complex science of a vaccine's safety and efficacy to the general public to ensure that people feel safe receiving it? 
Yeah, that's a little harder for me to answer because I don't I don't work for the companies. I, I would say I sit on lots of calls with them. I think in my own opinion, it's really sort of less um, or that we need their responsibility for that less in the sense that there are so many groups that find it their mission to look at vaccines, making recommendations on who gets them um, and really kind of break down the science and the results from these studies um, in ways that are applicable and understandable. The, sort of, as I mentioned, all those groups before, the COVPN and others, they're doing this on a regular basis, breaking down what's being published and putting it into a context and trying to make it available widely. To sort of give you an example, I think at every layer of um, provision of care and, and including from like primary care physicians to even UNCs. So an example of that at UNC, myself and many of my our colleagues have been asked to do several town halls. At first, it was to even address this issue with healthcare workers. You know, some were saying they didn't want to get vaccinated. So we had to try to address some of the misinformation and mistrust um, just within our uh, sort of own setting of employees. Since then, I've also been asked to do lots of, uh, of um, have lots of input on what would be um, sort of communicated more widely to UNC patients across the state of North Carolina. So I, in my own opinion, I think it's the pharmaceutical companies or the companies that are making these vaccines, it's kind of their role to have the data be clear and presented to the rest of us. And then it's really kind of, I think, more our role to break it down, provide uh, provide it to our patients, to our clinics, to our state um, and, and ways that are understandable and also make it easy. Um, I totally agree with Dr. Collins about the issue of misinformation um, and trying to both ourselves and amongst our friends and our colleagues, et cetera, be very, very mindful of where we're getting our information from. So I think UNC, other academics, uh, the CDC, the COVP, and all of us, it's all of our responsibility to make this information understandable, to um, make it easy to find. Um, and I now talk to every single one of my patients about COVID vaccines when I see them. Great. Thank you, Akshra. And now, Gracie. Hi, Dr. Gay. Um, I'm Gracie, and I was wondering what was the process like in terms of developing the vaccine? Uh, again, there, there would be somebody else who could answer this question better, but, but I've, I've, again, sat on so many calls that I'll answer it to the best that I can. I think it was a lot like it was for us in the sense that, um, as Dr. Corbett mentioned, once they had the sequence of the virus, so they knew physically how to make it, I think it was all hands on deck at these companies, uh, meaning six, seven days a week into the evenings. Um, and essentially, I think for them, like us, um, all other research was basically put on hold. We really couldn't bring in other clinics anymore, but I think they put everything else on hold or at least deprioritized it to focus on that. Um, I can tell you that um, we all have now standing calls on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, my staff would work until you know five and then they go home and get on the phone. And I know that all the people involved with the leadership roles in these uh, studies are doing that. And I know through my role with Novavax that they're just working around the clock all the time. So I think it was, you know, they knew how to make these vaccines. They had, um, they've been doing it uh, for other viruses and they just took uh, that and pivoted it. And like us started hiring new staff to be able to do more and, and less time um, just, you know, as fast as they could. Thank you, Gracie. And now our last question, Magana. Hello, Dr. Gay. Um, my name is Megan Achimardi, and my question is, how has collaboration among members of the scientific community changed as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, this, this was unprecedented to have this many groups focused in overseeing uh, these vaccine trials. Um, you know, some of these standing calls I mentioned, they'll have over 100 people sitting on them, and that's just one call, and then you'll have another call with a different 100 people. I think you know our challenge is eventually when we look back on this, what worked and didn't work. I think what worked for the vaccine trials was this incredible commitment um, across these different groups of um, resources and people and time. Um, so I would envision, I think, that if we uh, you know have to deal with another pandemic anytime soon, something similar like that would sort of be the model. 
I think there are things that we definitely were learning we could have done better in a pandemic and other people have touched on that a little bit. Um, I think we've also learned ways to uh, reach out to these um, communities that haven't really participated in research as much. I think my hope is that won't fade off, that won't taper off, that we'll can continue to do that for other reasons outside of even just COVID uh, vaccine trials. So I, I hope that that will continue. But I think that in you know uh, a global tragedy, global pandemic, people would come together as they did in this way um, with the right experts and the right expertise, the right um, sort of passion, the right goal. Um, because I think in a few years, if not already, we'll see that the, the success of these vaccine trials is going to be like a um, considered one of the greatest medical, you know, sort of uh, uh, successes or events or whatever you, you want to call it of uh, our decade, uh, if not more than that. Thanks. Megan, I thank you. And that what a great place to end. Uh, Cindy, thank you for a tremendous talk and for all you're doing uh, to promote health equity and vaccine access and uh, bringing these extraordinary advances in science to so many people. Um, that brings us to the end of this extraordinary session. What an amazing lineup of uh, speakers we had. Uh, congratulations to Todd and Amy and Bob for bringing together this extraordinary and inspirational group. Thanks to the students for their remarkable questions. A year ago, uh, when this all started, I remember saying at the first few meetings of uh, our team at Science, well, let's cover this now, but you know, people aren't going to stay interested in this for very long. Uh, I was wrong about that. And I take a lot of hope from that because people are really interested in now virology and immunology and health equity and biostatistics and lots of things that uh, people hadn't thought about before and the enlightenment that that uh, is bringing to the world and especially through the people we heard from today is a reason to be hopeful about the future. Uh, the workshops start at one o'clock so everybody come back for that and in the meantime take a break and have your lunch and to everyone involved, uh, Chancellor Roberts, Amy, Bob, the speakers, the students, Thank you all for inspiring me today. Chancellor, amazing school you've got, my friend. And uh, thank you for the great job you do taking care of it. Holden, thank you so much. And thanks again to all of our, our guests. Just what, a, what an amazing event and great, unbelievable opportunity for us to have you know folks like yourself and all of our panelists with us today. So thank you so much for your time and good to see you. Hope to see you in person one of these days. Yes, sir. Getting closer. <laughs>